Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. San Bonani, Huyenar. May I request that we all rise so that the national anthem can be sung. gentlemen, my name is Tolan Tubazana. I'm going to be your program director tonight. May I request that we all pay attention to the video that is going to be played right now. It will be a video about the evacuation in this building in case something unbecoming happened. But we are not saying it will happen. We are in a very, very safe place, but in anything that we do, there is always a risk. Hence, it's important that that video is being played. Immediately after that video has been played, we are then going to play the two videos. The first video will be about the 150th celebration of this giant University of the Land, which is the University of South Africa, which will then be followed by another video, which will be about our being here this evening. Sizela ngomtimbi omkulu, wuguzo narisha imsebenzi emkulu ekameni liga baba liga mkulu liga Koko Ubaba or Dr. J. L. Dube. Once those have been done, Amazebra, which is Ulange High School Choir, will come and take the podium just to entertain us. Thank you. I'm not going to be coming back until Ulange High School have entertained us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Sir, can you please play that? Welcome to the Durban ICC, where the world meets Africa. As a leading world-class events facility, we make your safety our number one priority. Please give us your attention for a few minutes to take you through some important health and safety information. As the Durban ICC is a public space, please remember to keep your personal belongings safe and with you at all times. We have many bathrooms for you to use around the venue. They are clearly marked in the foyer and concourse areas. 
The Durban ICC is a smoke-free building, but we do have clearly marked smoking zones outside the main entrance and in the courtyards opposite the concourse. Please make use of these areas and the ashtrays provided when you smoke. In the event of a medical emergency, please dial the emergency number 031-360-1111 for assistance. The Durban ICC has developed a very simple emergency evacuation plan that everyone must be familiar with. Our staff are specially trained and will be there to assist you in following this plan. In the event of an evacuation, an announcement will be made to leave the venue. Please remain calm and walk swiftly to the nearest emergency exit in the concourse area. These exit doors are clearly marked. Security guards and the marshals will also help direct you out of the building. Please do not use any lifts or escalators in the event of an emergency. Once outside, you will be directed to the nearest assembly point by the marshals for your safety. Please wait at the assembly point until the venue has been cleared and the marshal deems it safe for you to return to your seats. Thank you for your time and enjoy this event. John Langa Libalele Dube, His Life and Works. An essayist, philosopher, educator, politician, publisher, editor, novelist, and poet, was born at Inanda Mission Station of the American Zulu Mission in Natal on 11 February 1871 to the great James and Elizabeth Dewey. He was the founding president of the South African Native National Congress, which in 1923 became the African National Congress. Whilst attending college in Amazimdot, he met William Wilcox, an American missionary, whom he accompanied to America to attend the Oberlin Preparatory Academy. In his experience there, he cultivated the skills, connections, and worldly perspective which laid the foundation for his later accomplishment. He found a profound meaning to Wilcox's concept that stated, industrial education was the best way to uplift the native people of Africa. In 1897, Dube returned once more to the U.S. for further training. He enrolled at the Union Missionary Seminary in Brooklyn, New York. And in March 1899, Dube was ordained as a priest by the Congregational Church. During this visit, Dube was profoundly influenced by Booker T. Washington an activist and educator who encouraged his students to become self-reliant by teaching them practical skills. Dube used similar principles at the Zulu Christian Industrial Institute, which he established in August 1900. And in 1901, it was renamed the Ohlange Institute. Dube felt deeply that Africans should stand together. During the early 1900s, he established links with like-minded leaders, and they formed the Natal Native Congress in July 1900. The NCC brought issues such as land ownership, education, parliamentary representation, free trade, and freedom from enforced labor to the attention of the colonial government. Furthermore, in 1903, Dube established the first indigenous Zulu newspaper, Ilanga Lasenatal, as a mouthpiece for blacks. It propagated the idea of a united African front, 
and exposed injustices, criticized government policies, and made black people aware of their rights and privileges. Numerous meetings were held by Africans, coloreds, and Indians to protest the white-only nature of the constitutional discussions that took place from 1908 to 1909. Not long after, several hundred members of South Africa's educated African elite met at Bloemfontein on January 8, 1912. The outcome was the formation of the South African Native National Convention, with Dube as the president. By 1935, Dube founded the Natal Bantu Teachers Association, today known as the Natal African Teachers Union for Professional Black Teachers. Dube was successful in his endeavors in contributing to the political and socio-economic development of blacks in Natal. He fought the injustices against black people and tried to gain a sense of equity through his lifetime. Dube is remembered for his influential literary works, including an essay, Umundu Isita Sake Ukobo in 1910. It earned him an honorary doctor of philosophy in 1992. In addition, his popular historical novel, Insila Kashaka, was published in 1930. He became the first biographer in African literature when he wrote the biographies of the Zulu royal family, especially that of King Dini Zulu. Dr. J. L. Dube died in February 1946 and will be remembered as an influential fighter for the rights of black Africans. Will Ngom summed up his life when he wrote in Umteleli Wabantu on 26 February 1946. Dube has revealed to the world at large that it is not quite true to say that an African is incompetent as far as achievement is concerned. Whatever the setbacks of the moment, nothing can stop us now. Whatever the difficulties, Africa shall be at peace. However improbable it may sound to the skeptics, Africa will prosper. Education is the light in a dark room. It's the spark of a dream passport to the future and the seed of generational change. Through education, we reflect on yesterday and define tomorrow. UNISA stands at the pinnacle of education through open distance e-learning with a footprint of students in 130 countries worldwide, rooted in South Africa and the African continent. UNISA can truly claim to be the African University in the service of humanity. Since the founding of the university in 1873, as an examining body, we have been a trailblazer. UNISA is the first and only institution in South Africa to carry our country's name with pride and the first public university in the world to exclusively teach by means of distance education, an ever-changing dynamic university with a global reach. UNISA's history spans the entire modern history of South Africa, opening up a world of academic study opportunities to former activists and struggle heroes, thought leaders, business people, legal experts, acclaimed entertainers, and sports stars. The university takes pride in the more than 900,000 alumni, making their mark in diverse fields and capacities. 
At UNISA, the World Wide Web is our educational playground, but we also have beautiful and impressive campuses. UNISA's Makalniak campus is located in the city of Tswane and is a major landmark of the capital city. We encouraged our students to communicate with the university via online platforms, but you can visit the UNISA's Sunnyside campus, the perfect setting for students to engage with fellow students over a cup of inspiration. The science campus in Florida, Johannesburg, is designed to meet the education and research needs of students in a range of programs, including agriculture, nature conservation, consumer sciences, engineering, computing and physics, to name a few. Students in the sciences now have access to UNISA's own laboratories, housing some of the most state-of-the-art infrastructure and laboratory equipment available. Distance learning requires that you study at your own time and in your own space, but that doesn't mean you're on your own. You can also visit a UNISA regional center to get advice, meet other students, make use of UNISA services, have conversations with counselors, and use our academic libraries. We offer an unparalleled range of study choices, ranging from short courses and certificate programs to three and four year degrees, diplomas, as well as master's and doctoral degrees, with close to 380,000 current students. Our rich tapestry of study disciplines includes the College of Accounting Sciences, Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, Economic and Management Sciences, Education, Graduate Studies, Human Sciences, Law, Science, Engineering and Technology, and the Graduate School of Business Leadership as well as the Tabumbeki School of Public and International Affairs. As a comprehensive open distance e-learning pioneer, UNISA is known for delivering well-designed, interactive study material and integrated student support. Students have access to a menu of support services ranging from face-to-face -face tutorials and academic literacy services to study groups and e-tutors. One of UNISA's main aims is to harness the new and emerging potential in information and communication technology, catapulting the university into a truly digital future. To this end, examinations are conducted on college-specific exam portals and are accessed from the My Exams portal. UNISA is well-placed to address society's most demanding challenges by using research to meaningfully transform the lives of those in our communities. To that end, UNISA is working towards instituting the following catalytic niche areas. Marine studies, aviation and aeronautical studies, automotive studies, energy studies, space study and square kilometer array, fourth industrial revolution and digitalization, natural sciences, health studies or medicine, feminist, womanist, Bosadi theorizations, and student support and co-curricular activities. As Africa's leading open distance e-learning university, UNISA strives to keep up with the constantly evolving higher education landscape in order to serve our students to the best of our ability. We can reflect with great pride on the past 150 years of transformational education and we are confident in our ability to succeed and become a truly high-performance university as we define tomorrow.
Thank you kuma zebra. Siyabonga kakulu bantwa na betu. Ndabangu tisonke silizwele le litulo elimnante. Egate litulo anjenga manje. Litulo ikwaya. Bantwa na betu abafunda. Otlange high school. Izingane zigababa. O. Uzuete. Umkaju. Siyabonga mkaju. Siyabonga msebenzi yako. May. I now request Umama Unomusa Umatube Wagwanube Nguti Ezenga Pambili as was welcome Mobanga Pande Wake Ngekeswazu Kulega Umama U Premia Way to Lona. Ogu mama o prima we to kala ule province always map siabonga mam prim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, program director. Mr. Dubazane, I do wish to acknowledge uh, my family. Um, Ubutlanga and all other members of the family. Um, I also wish to acknowledge our keynote speaker tonight and Oshlange alumni, former judge of the Appeal Court and Deputy Chair of the High Court Justice, Judge um, Jali, the Principal and Vice Chancellor at UNISA, Prof. Len Kabula, the Executive Dean of College of Economics and Management, Sciences at UNISA, Prof. Thomas Mohale, the Vice Principal of the Postgraduate Studies and Innovation and Commercialization, Professor Meiwa. I do wish to acknowledge the Vice Principal, um, Prof. Ndlovu and um, the Vice Principal of Research, Prof. I do wish to acknowledge all of you, um, the Acting Dean, um, Prof. Kumalo, as well as um, all other leadership of this uh, giant institution in our continent. Allow me to also acknowledge the first deputy chairperson is also I, my co-chairperson of the KZN Human Resource Development Council, Mr. Mkize, and other members of the Human Resource um, Development Council of KwaZulu Natal. I do wish to acknowledge the provincial commissioner. General Konazi and all the representatives, the National African Federation of Federated Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Ngema, and all other delegates that are here today. I acknowledge as well all the civil society organization, the scholars of Oshlange, high school, the members of the University Council, and the executive and extended management, all senior government officials and business community members that are here, all the representatives um, that are attending um, here in attendance today. 
distinguished um, guest, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Sunburn, Nicole? Okay. There's so much light here, I can't even see where than could. Allow me to start um, by reminding all of us of this code. You have asked me to lead, and perchance you've asked me how I intend to do so. I will show you my frame of mind and ideal in two words. Christina, hasten slowly. I recognize that hour has come that we, the native races of South Africa, must be up and doing. But I recognize too the necessity of moving cautiously, of making progress prudently. Festina, make haste slowly. These are the two famous words that were to be uttered by Dr. John Langlebelele Dube as he entered the uncharted territory accepting to lead the South African African Native Congress, later to be named ANC, following its founding Congress in Bloemfontein in 1912. The words were representative of a people staring at the tightening news of the oppressive racist machine of white rule following the consolidation of the Union of South Africa in, in, in 1910 that excluded black people. The statement by J.L. Dube was no doubt a declaration that the time has come for African people to rise in unity, define their mission clearly, and speak in one voice against the injustice that was becoming a rising threat of unity for all the people. Trust is the responsibility to lead the first united front of the people against racial oppression in South Africa. The Christian, Dr. Dube, may well have drawn inspiration from the book of Esther, who declares in the New International Version Testament, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance of the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And these are the words that even today they still are relevant as they were at the time. Program Director, as the Premier of KwaZulu-Natal, I'm honored to stand here at such a time as this one, several generations later, as we head into the 30 years of our democracy. I'm pleased to say that I am Along with millions of fellow South Africans, I am a beneficiary of the pioneering struggles of icons such as Dr. Langalibalele Dube. This evening, for years to come, we will continue to honor this visionary leader whose clarity and foresight and commitment to the cause will continue to define our own vision for the future to come. As we celebrate with this inaugural public lecture, I'm deeply honored this evening as a member of the broader Dube family that the ANC, which Dr. J.L. Dube founded, has given me this historic task to lead our province at such a time like this one. The theme, promoting unity and human rights for community empowerment celebrating the 151 years of Dr. John Langalibalele Dube's legacy is an appropriate tribute to mark the launch of this inaugural commemoration public lecture. We are also privileged to be addressed this evening by Judge Jali, a son of KwaZulu-Natal and Orlange alumni, who has distinguished himself 
as an eminent jurist and corporate trailblazer. We look forward to your keynote address and more to come as we define the edge of Dr. J.L. Dube, family in the memories of this current and future generations of our leaders to come in our country. I do wish to congratulate the Vice Chancellor in the spirit to allow the congratulatory messages of our country's pioneering leaders, UNISA for reaching the milestone of 150 years of higher education of excellence as largest and oldest institutions in the sub-Saharan Africa and abroad, and a global leader in quality universal education. No institution has fostered the dream of Africa's agenda 2063 and the vision of an African renaissance like we've seen in UNISA. Allow me then also on behalf of the province of KwaZulu-Natal to convey our hearty congratulations to UNISA and Vice Chancellor on her inventor as a new principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of South Africa. Prof, you have made history as the first woman, the first black woman, and the third black person to head this great institution an accolade that is worthy of long celebrations across all corners of our vast African country. The seemingly, I think, yes, it does deserve the celebratory applause. This was seemingly a distant possibility way back in 150 years ago. When Dr. Dube was born, I have no doubt that the seeds of such transformation were planted when Dr. Dube started his own Oshange Institute with the vision that Africans would in future run academies like everyone else in the world. Let me therefore also thank um, Prof and all of your leadership and members of our Human Resource Development Council of KwaZulu-Natal the Dr. J. L. Dube Legacy Foundation and the family for leading the partnership cooperation agreement between the Guazulu Natal Provincial Government and the University of South Africa. This annual public lecture launch consummates the long relationship unfolding between our institution that is anchored on defining the legacy of J. L. Dube. As announced during the State of the Province Address, our province seeks to develop a model citizen that is guided by the values of leaders like Dr. J. L. Dube. As our theme stipulates among these values and commitments to unity, the pursuit of excellence through education and skills development, self-awareness and selflessness, commitment to serve, to be able to serve in, even others. To cement this legacy of this giant, our provincial government and UNISA have agreed to cooperate in various areas, such as work integrated learning for UNISA students, cooperation in supporting unemployed graduates and undergraduates, skills development and training initiatives for unemployed, the development of the maritime industry, incubation of startups, capacity building of public servants, joint research initiative and community engagement projects. And I do wish to thank the university for really partnering with us in government because we need more people like and institutions like UNISA to join hands so that we can do more for our people. Let me convey once more my gratitude to the provincial government, to the family of J. L. Dube, on the launch of this public lecture. Today we are awakening and draw strength from the spirit of Uma Fuguzela, 
a giant of whose broad shoulders our province will for generations stand as we soldier forward towards a better, non-racial, non-sexist, prosperous, and an equal KwaZulu-Natal for all its people. With these words, I wish to welcome all of you and thank you once more for this inaugural Dr. J. L. Duba lecture. I thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Premier, for a moving welcome speech that you have just shared with us. Can we get another round of applause, please? At some stage, Dr. J. L. Dube said, I quote, to teach the hand to work, the brain to understand, and the heart to feel is a very, very important quotation that we are gathered tonight as people who are today a testament to that. You saw the video when it was played. I'm not going to be stealing anything from the keynote speaker that he's still going to share with us together also with our two discounted, that is Professor Meiwa and Professor Kumalo. But you saw the things, the work that Dr. J. L. Dube did, and you ask yourself, really, where was this energy coming from to do all these things that he did within a short span of time? Because if you look at his age, he didn't live too long to have done all the things that he did. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now call upon Professor S.K. Ndovu, who is one of our vice principal of UNISA, to come to the podium and lead us in an item that is before us, which is a message of support which he will be doing on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and the Principal of UNISA. Whilst he is speaking, you will continue with your status, except to say that I request that we shouldn't make noise so that you can also be listening to the message that is coming from, the message of support which is coming from our Vice Chancellor, Professor Linkabula. Thank you. Program Director, <clears throat> Mr. Kodani Tubazane, Honorable Madam Premier, Namsa Dube Mube, Premier of uh, KwaZulu Natal Province. I'm not sure whether Premier you know that I'm from. <laughs> also, I'm from Wazulu Nadal. I hail from Kabaglova up in Newcastle, Ebakulusin. Honorable Justice Tabani Jali, former Deputy Judge President of the Wazulu Nadal Province. Professor Tenjiwe Meiwa, our Vice Principal Research, Postgraduate Studies, Innovation and Commercialization. Professor Simangaliso Kumalo, 
Acting Dean, School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Mr. Langalbale Dube Jr., or grandson of um, Dr. J.L. Dube. Dr. Joyce Mieza, our regional director, uh, KwaZulu Natal region. Our representatives from national, provincial, and local government. Representatives from other institutions of higher learning and the education sector. Members of the university executive and extended management, the business community, representatives from various organized labor, members of the University of South African community in attendance, our distinguished guests. Good evening. San Bonan. I am pleased that I am standing here on behalf of our principal and vice chancellor, Professor Lengabule, who has requested me to indicate that she would have been very much be here herself, but unfortunately due to the BRICS commitment and also the presidential in Bizo tomorrow, she was unable to, but she is here in spirit, and definitely she is also uh, watching. We are pleased to welcome all the participants at the University of South Africa. This is our inaugural Dr. Langalwale de Tube annual lecture. This lecture takes place during our period of celebrating 150 years of our August University. UNISA's 150th anniversary birthday celebrations marks an important milestone in the history of South African and global institutions. On the 26th of June, 2023, which marked exactly 150 years since UNISA was established on the same day, 26 June, 1873. We had a huge and a successful celebration. UNISA was initially called the University of the Cape of Good Hope. At the time of its establishment, it was renamed later to the University of South Africa, UNISA, in 1916 and effectively moved to Pretoria in 1918. The foresight to make UNISA the first university in the world to adopt the open distance education modality as far back as 1946 has positioned UNISA well in the aftermath of, of the COVID-19 pandemic and consequent accelerated developments in digital technologies. We will continue to adapt our knowledge, production modalities, research, innovation, community engagement approaches, and to address the evolving needs of our students. Our immediate community in South Africa, the African continent, and the rest of the world. We remain committed to a quote, I quote, reclaiming Africa's intellectual futures, unquote, into the next 150 years and beyond. UNISA spawned the university system in South Africa. After UNISA's establishment in 1873, a number of now independent universities like the University of Cape Town, the University of the Vedvatesans, were established as university colleges of UNISA. It is therefore not an exaggeration to say that UNISA is the grandmother of all universities in South Africa. Over the past 15 decades, 
ENISA has made education accessible to countless students who may not have been able to pursue higher education otherwise. This allegiance to reaching out to students and providing them with opportunities for individual and professional advancement in a testament to UNISA's dedication to serving humanity. We continue commitment. We, co we, we continue to commit to deepen and sharpen UNISA's commitment to broadening access to knowledge, reaching out to students from diverse backgrounds, including working professionals, adult students, persons with disabilities, and students from rural areas, among others. By educating these underserved groups, UNISA has paved the way for social mobility and economic empowerment, thus social responsibility and, of course, global impact. All these signify the commitment to reclaiming Africa's intellectual futures. We were honored that when we celebrated our 150th anniversary on the 26th of June, it was also the 68th, 68th anniversary of the Freedom Charter that was adopted in Cliptown on the 26th of June 1955. This is significant because, as we know, the values contained in the Freedom Charter have shaped the constitution of the democratic South Africa. Today, we honor a giant of the liberation movement in Africa who we are blessed to count amongst the founding fathers of our democracy, Dr. John Langalibalele Duben who was a social entrepreneur, an educational and a political leader whose work was underpinned by his faith. Reverend John Langalbal Le Dube, born on the 22nd of February, 1871, two years before UNISA's birth in 1783. He was the son of the soil, born at Inanda Mission Station. The place of his birth is testament to his deep Christian family roots. His, his, his grandmother, Dalita Mashange Dube, was the first Christian convert at the Inanda Mission Station. His father, Reverend James Dube, was also a, the a theologian. John Albert Dube attended school at the Linden Mission Station, which was ran by the American Zulu Mission. This was the beginning of his association with the American theologians that shaped his career for years to come and saw him both study and work in the United States of America. Research conducted by Prof. Sheriff Keita from Carlton College in Minnesota shows that Reverend John Langalbal Le Dubes first traveled to the U USA in 1877 at the initiation of Reverend William Cullen Wilcox and his wife, Aida Bella Wilcox. From 1886 to 1887, John Dube worked as a cleaner at Oberlin College where Reverend William Wilcox taught. Dube later enrolled as a student at the same college from 1888 to 1890. However, his deteriorating health made him to return to South Africa before completing his studies. John Dube returned twice to the USA, accompanied by his wife, Nobutela Ndima Dube. He studied theology at the Union Missionary Training Institute in Brooklyn. He was later ordained as a priest by the Congressional Church in March 1899. Dube also lectured in the USA while on tour with Reverend Wilcox. Reverend Dube was a visionary. His commitment to serving his people back home saw him return to work as a church minister in South Africa. He established first African language newspaper in Langa, Asenatali, in around 1903. 
That newspaper is still published today, exactly 120 years later. As principal and vice chancellor of UNISA, standing on behalf of Prof. Lenkabule, she had identified 10 catalytic niche areas that we hope not only activate and enhance academic agenda, but will also enhance our experiences and as engaged scholars who refuse to be academic pies in the sky, scholars who will care to address the needs of our society. These include marine studies, aviation and aeronautic studies, automotive, energy, space study, square, meter, square kilometer array, fourth industrial revolution, revolution and digitalization, natural sciences, health studies, but more importantly, feminist, womanist, Bosadi theorization. I'll tell you why I make this particular point. And lastly, student support and co-curricular activities. As, as is evident from the list above, feminist, womanist, Bosadi theorization is part of our analytic, catalytic niche area. We at UNISA strongly support the move to reverse the erasure of women from history. We choose to call it her story. I will therefore speak about the her story of Mama Nobutela Ndima Dube, the first wife of Reverend John Langalwale Dube, who served alongside him in the many initiatives they started together. As will be seen later, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the initiatives that are publicly attributed to Reverend Do Dr. Langalwale Dube were actually the work of Mama Nobutela Ndima Dube. I will therefore attribute such projects to her directly, where she was the sole initiator. She outlived her husband by several years and worked hard to preserve his legacy long after he passed on. The year 2023 is also the 150th anniversary of the birth of Mama Nogutela de Magdube. She was born in 1873 and passed away on the 25th January 1917 at the age of 44. The year 2017 was therefore the centenary of her death. Patriarchy have brushed her contributions to the formation of our nation out of written history, we will try and work harder to write her story. UNISA collaborated with the Tabo Begum Foundation to host the Tabo Begum Presidential Library, which uses President Tabo Begum's life and times to tell the much bigger story of the history of the African liberation struggle from colonialism, apartheid, and oppression. The history of liberation movements in Africa is strongly intertwined with the history of the African National Congress. This is because the ANC is the oldest liberation movement in Africa. It was called the South African Native National Congress when it was formed on 8 January 1912. Of course, Reverend John Langalbal Ledube served as the founding president of the SANNC, now called the ANC. Ms. Nautela Dube is never mentioned when the history of the formation of the SANC, now ANC mentioned. She did not formally hold membership of the organization because in 1912, women were not allowed to be admitted into full membership of the organization. Despite this, Mamanobute Randima Dube played an important role at the inaugural meeting on the 8th of January. Significantly, she trained the choir that performed Gosi Sigalele Africa, composed by Inok Sontonga, with the A, with the ASANNC adopted as its official anthem at the end of the historic meeting. The foresight and the vision of Mamanogutela and Matube lives on because after the SANC 
adopted Kosasigalela as its national anthem. It was subsequently adopted by other liberation movements in Africa. Many independent African states have included it as part of their national anthem. The hair story of Mama Nogutela de Madube therefore lives on. She was posthumously awarded the Order of the Baobam in gold in April 2017 during the year of the centenary of her death. Mama Nogutela Dube, born 1873, studied at Inanda Seminary. This was a time when formal education was not accessible to women. Even more remarkable is that she already had a career when she married Reverend Don, John Lagalwale Dube. She was already working as a teacher, a rare occurrence in those days. Her achievements were way ahead of the time. She studied music and home economics in the United States of America. She, she was also a singer, a seamstress, a published author, a founder and builder of endurable, endurable institutions that still stand today. She was a central figure in the establishment of Utlanga Institute where she taught. She developed the curriculum at Utlanga Institute and was part of the faculty. She established an international partnership as a fundraiser who traveled the world in the late 19th century when very few among the privileged white men and women at the time could achieve such a feat. Mama Nogutela de Madube was a gifted singer. She sang as part of the joint fundraising campaign she undertook with her husband in the United States. In 1911, Mama Nogutela Dube co-authored with her husband, Dr. Lagalbale Dube, a Zulu songbook entitled Amakama Bantu. This book is regarded as a landmark in the development of Zulu choral music. Reverend John Lagalbale Dube did something unusual for the times they both lived by acknowledging his wife's contribution for the music in the book Amakama Bantu. Apart from popularizing Gosigalela, her singing talent helped to raise funds for Ushange Institute. We have to thank the press in the United States of America for writing about Mama Nogutela de Matube in 1899. While their writings were motivated by racism, it helped to document her life in ways we would not have known otherwise. This is because there is no record of her being written about in South Africa in the 1980s and 1900s. It is therefore ironic that she remained unknown in the press in her own country until after her death, but was written about in the United States of America. In 1899, she appeared in an article of the New York Sun entitled Ideas of a Woman, Customs of the Savage State which she prefers to civilization, unquote. That article chronicled the life of a Zulu woman from South Africa who amazed American reporters and readers were curious about an educated Zulu woman who spoke English fluently and was very gracious. Ramon Ogutele Dube therefore represented an image of an African greatly at odds with what they imagined, imagined Africans to be. They were especially surprised that she was highly opinionated and criticized what she saw in the United States, the so-called American civilization, which she compared rather unfavorably to African civilization. Americans were particularly surprised that she said she, she preferred to return to Africa. Hence, Sheriff Keita once quote Nogutela Dube in the article saying, I quote, I will tell you why we are here. We do not want to teach our people all your civilization, only enough to be their own condition, not to make them unnatural and unhappy. The Zulus are not dull. They are intelligent, but they do not know how to do things themselves. 
They think it is only white men who can make houses and cities. The women attend the business and they do all the labor. They dig the ground, they plant the crops, build the huts for storing them, and do all the heavy work, unquote. With the passage of time, the American newspaper came to admire Mamana Wutela and Maduga. The LA Times edition of 13 January 1899 wrote glowingly about her saying, I quote, Nobutela is young with blazing black eyes, smooth brown skin, and handsome regular features. She speaks English with a deliberation that is charming and in the softest voice in the world. Her manner is grace itself, unquote. Those of you who probably have seen her tombstone would probably acknowledge um, that uh, in her tombstone, those words are enshrined. <clears throat> so, those words are enshrined. I just lost my, my state where I was. <laughs> Somebody's calling me. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so from that point of view, we, we, we are saying as a university, we do want to take this further as part of the UNISA's Busadi theorization. Back to... Reverend John Lagalbale Dube, affectionately called Mafuzela, who the founding president of the ANC in 1912, was also involved in the formation of the National Native Convention in July 1990. The year 1900 was the year in which the first Pan-African Congress uh, took place on the 23rd and 25th um, of July in London. The speakers of the Congress included W.E.B. Dubois, George James Christian, and John E. Quinland. The women who spoke at the first Pan-African Congress included Anna H. Jones and Anna J. Cooper. It is important to mention the names of the women who spoke at the first Pan-African Congress because their participation is often erased out of history. So we tell their story. Dr. John Larbel Dube was greatly inspired by Booker T. Washington's ideas about industrial education and self-sufficiency. Washington saw them as prerequisites for African-American liberation. So John Dube also established the Zulu Christian Industrial Institute in 1900, which was renamed the Ushlange Institute in 1903 and still operates today as Ushange High School. Interestingly, John Langalbole Dube and Booker T. Washington were inspired by the learning and labor motto of Oberlin College, where Dube's benefactor, Reverend William Cullen Wilcox, taught. This approach encouraged providing Africans and African Americans with formal education coupled with industrial education to ensure that they were not only educated, but also had skills to, be, to the development of their communities. Ladies and gentlemen, the legacy of John Langalwale Dube includes him being a part of the delegation to the United Kingdom to petition against the colonial administration's land policy in the colony called the Union of South Africa, which was formed in 1910. His newspaper, Ilanga, Natal, which was published, which was published in several African languages before being published exclusively in Sizul, like Nobutel, John Duben was way ahead of his time in terms of his ideas and initiatives. I thank you. Thank you, Professor 
Kacheni, boya benyati. Mfana wanga giti, siya bonga kakulu. I know that as all the speakers are taking the podium, we have got colleagues who are busy recording the entire occasion, right from the start up to the end. Prof. Linkabula will be very happy, Professor Nlovu, that although you are a man, you have really gone all out of your way to represent her the way she was going to be if she was here. And you really took over the speech and deliver it as a speech of support as if you are here, although you are not. And thank you really for that. We are really inspired by that speech. And it's also good to hear that it is always true that for every successful man or a husband, there is a powerful woman behind. And we are, are celebrating the life of Dr. J. L. Dube, but today the support speech by Professor Lingabula has made prominent Ikama Ligakoko Unoktela Umamdima Oshangelaboge. Some of us take pride in Masizwalesos Bomo. My grandmother on my father's side is Umashange. So I'm also stealing a show there. Uh, uh, but besides that, celebrate life got to Ubela. And in Yasis with some good and good to Bazan. So, Naming Bianke and Elagan. Go to again, I see Kong Army. Can I now call upon uh, Umfuetu Eric Agatu Ugus Entertainer? Es Lidele towards the main cause Yanam Sanje. Eric, where are you? Oh, good. All right. Are you accompanied by somebody? Okay, the podium is yours. Thank you. You know how many minutes we are going to do? Uh, you can inform me if there's any changes. There are no changes. Okay. You are still a good listener. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, program director. Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Molweni. Ninjani Anam uh, Diapila. My name is Eric Kanam, uh, but uh, born Epizana. Um, and I'm not on my own today. I'll be singing a few songs. And I'm accompanied by Mr. Toby Simtalane, who um, is a songwriter, producer, pianist, etc., etc. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy our presentation.
Gonna sing it with me. Are you ready? We go to a party. Everyone turns to see this beautiful lady walking around. And I say yes, I feel wonderful tonight. Help me here. Tonight, 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 tonight. Okay. Tonight, tonight, tonight. I want to hear you sing it now. Tonight, tonight. Come on. Tonight. Oh, tonight, tonight, tonight. Only the ladies, only the ladies, only the ladies. Let's go. Tonight. Oh. Oh. All right, the gents. Said it's time to go home now. Got a aching head, so I give her the car key. She helps me to bed, and then I tell her as I turn. Say, my darling, you are wonderful tonight. Only the gentlemen. Tonight, tonight. Was that my face? Tonight, tonight. Hey, tonight, tonight, tonight. One more time. Tonight, tonight, tonight. Tonight, tonight, tonight. That was for you, ladies. Give us a round of applause. No, the gentleman did well in the end. We want to say thank you to the ladies that sang first. Da 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 da. You know, I can't see you guys. I'll be very honest. It's very daunting to be on stage, but it's okay. I hope you can feel me. Can you feel me? Can you feel Mr. Mtalan? Okay, I'm reaching out to you now, right? Reaching out to you. Reach out to me. Reach out to me. Please reach out to me. Please reach. All right. Okay. Hey, we see you in the back there. Thank you so much. Should we go local or maybe let's go Central Africa? Malaika, 
Only this side. Only this side. Nikon, let's go. Almost there. Three, two, one. Okay, I'm gonna leave you all there. This side. Again, again. Dinner is served, good people. The dinner is served whilst entertainment is going on. Thank you. What is the order? What is the order? In terms of table. You are requested to sit on your table. The wait the waitresses will come and take your table when it's time for it. Thank you. Thank you, program director. <laughs> Remember, right? Hey! 
And this side, how do we go? One more time. You know, you dancing like you should be this side. You dancing like you should be this side, you know? The move. Let's go. Okay, I'm this side. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, hey, I hope this one goes with your food. We're doing a food pairing. You know, the music and the food must go together. <laughs> When I wake up in the morning, love, hey, and the sunlight hurts my eye. Something without warning, love, is heavy on my mind. Then I look at you, and the world is so Just one look at you, I know it's gonna be together a lovely day, a lovely day. When the day that lies ahead of me Seems impossible to face Someone else instead of me Always seems to know the way Then I look at you And the world is alright It's alright in there just one look at you, I know it's gone, it's gonna be a lovely Lovely day, 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 a lovely day, lovely day, a lovely day, lovely day, lovely day, lovely day. 
Well, the day that lies ahead of me seems impossible to face. Someone else instead of me always seems to know the way. Then I look at you. It's a light in me Just, just one look at you Oh no, it's gonna, it's gonna be A lovely day ah. A lovely day so much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a lovely day. It indeed is a beautiful, beautiful day. Um, very happy to be here tonight. And thank you for having us. Please enjoy your dinner.
The colors of the rainbow Pretty in the sky Also the faces of people going by I see friends shaking hands Saying hi Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's a very uh, young song. Uh, that was most for the young people. Uh, this one we're going to do for the older people. Thank you so much.
Stay the same So don't even bother Asking me You know I say When I see your face There's not a thing That I would change Cause you're Just the 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hope you're having a wonderful time. Hope you're enjoying your food. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're happy to be with you. Yeah. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. It's not warm when she's away. She go. Wonder if she's gone to stay. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone to this house. In a home, anytime she goes away. I know, I know, I know, I know. Talani on keys, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. Thank you so much. <laughs> He's having fun with it. Ungati aigi funu gupela lengoma. 
Yabu ya yega, ya pimbe ya buya. Shesha kazi, oza brother. <laughs> I think he wants to say, I know, I know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I think we should do one more. Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. Where do you want to go? Just the two of us. Oh, two of us. Yeah. Okay, we're going to give you one more. And then we, uh, we'll take a small break and come back with more music later. Thank you. We're trying to give you songs you know, you know. We knew you were coming. I see the crystal rainbows fall And the beauty of it all Is when the sun comes shining through to make those rainbows in my mind When I think of you sometime I want to spend some time with you Just the two of us We can make it if we try Two of us You and I Just the two of us Building castles in the sky you and I What you won't do Do for us No, 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 no You tried everything But you won't give up In my world It's only you Make me do for love But I wouldn't do what you won't do, ooh, do for love, no, 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 no. You tried everything, everything, but you won't give up, oh. In my world, it's only you. Let me do for love, but I burden down. Just the two of us. <laughs> We can make it if we try Two of us You and I the Program director's gonna join me Just the two of us Building castles in the sky Two of us You and I Two of us You and I Two of us <laughs> Thank you ladies and gentlemen We'll be back <laughs> you and I <laughs> Thank you Hello Okay, thank you Thank you Eric Thank you so much with your, your friend in crime. We were really entertained. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now call upon Professor Mokhale, who is the Executive Dean of SAMS. That's the UNISA language, which is the College of Economic and Management Sciences at UNISA to come to the podium and share with us or give us an overview of the lecture, an introduction of theme, and our keynote speaker. Thank you, Prof. You can take the podium. Pro Pro 
Program Director, Mr. Diwazana. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide an overview of the journey traveled and why we are here today. Her Excellency, Premier of the Province of KwaZulu Natal, Ms. Nomusa Duwe Nguwe, Professor Ketha Ndlovu, Vice Principal, Strategy, Risk and Advisory Services, Professor Tenjiwe Meiwa with us here, Vice Principal UNISA, Research, Postgraduate Studies, Innovation and Commercialization. Professor Smangaliso Kumalo, Acting Dean, School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics. Members of UNISA Executive and Extended Management present here today. I also want to acknowledge the Dube family, represented by Langalivalele Dube here. I also, during the course of the day, met yet another important stakeholder uh, in the form of the family of the Ngobo, who have been such a pillar of strength to the Othlange High School. I want to acknowledge them here. The members of the Othlange Alumni Association, um, in their numbers, thank you very much representatives from the various sections of KwaZulu-Natal's Premier's Office, members of business community present here, the chairperson of UNISA Regional Student Representative Council, invited guests from media fraternity, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Dumelang, San Bonani, good afternoon, good evening. Just wanted to check if you are paying attention. The other day I was doing this and I said, the uh, Macheroni, meaning uh, good morning. And uh, I was saying it at the wrong time. So, um, it is indeed a pleasure for me to see us gathered here this evening to honor this legend, the icon for African liberation, for African development. But before I do that, I just want to remind us, remind us of where we are coming from. This lecture, this public lecture, is a product of a memorandum of understanding between UNISA and KwaZulu-Natal's Premier's Office. And the aim of the MOU was to facilitate cooperative relationship between UNISA and the province in terms of which the two parties undertake collaboration on matters of research, capacity building programs that MOU was signed in 2022. And um, you might have been aware that we've been trying to find a suitable date for this lecture. At some point, we mooted the date in February to coincide with uh, um, our icon's birthday, but it didn't materialize. And we are here today, July 13th, meeting our destiny in the way that we had planned it. This MOU is meant to be mutually beneficial to both parties and to also provide UNISA the opportunity to enhance and extend its research and tuition footprint 
within the province of KwaZulu-Natal through becoming more engaged with the needs of communities in this province. Similarly, the province wants to benefit by tapping into the university's research and tuition expertise for its capacity building programs. And you will have heard what the Premier said earlier on in terms of some of the identified areas on which collaboration might be pursued. The signing of a memorandum of understanding between the two parties has been quite a pro protracted process, but we were happy that at the end of the negotiations, which involved quite a number of parties, we were able to have it approved by both at the appropriate level. It supersedes any of the other pre-existing agreements between the province and, UNI and UNISA. And the College of Economic Management uh, Sciences is in this case involved because it was the spearheading college in making sure this MOU is, um, is, 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 is agreed upon and ultimately implemented. After the initiation was provided to us, from the Vice Chancellor's Office. The agreement includes cooperation between UNISA and the province on research and information sharing. This also means that they, we will cooperate when necessary to apply for research grants. Research grants and other avenues for financial and other support, such as from government agencies and private organization. The research agenda will focus on areas such as skills development, infrastructure development and management, economic growth, addressing poverty, unemployment, especially of the youth, and addressing issues of inequality and assisting in improved service delivery. Additionally, UNISA academics, working in collaboration with the KwaZulu-Natal government officials, will organize and prioritize research requests and initiatives. And I need to just uh, acknowledge my colleagues in the Economics and Management Sciences uh, College uh, who are here in management. Uh, chairs of departments are here directors of schools are here precisely to give support to this initiative and to demonstrate their availability to collaborate with government officials in pursuit of these objectives. On the research side, the university will assist with capacity building initiatives that include research in provincial fiscal policy reforms, budgeting, cost-effective procurement, service delivery models, private-public partnerships, introduction of innovation and technology, and many other fields that may be contemplated as a result. At the same time, the engagement with different departments in KwaZulu-Natal should enhance the university's research agenda and thereby lead to more scholarly engaged approach in the catalytic niche areas that Professor Ndlofu referred to earlier on in his um, speech. It is my view that it is important that education institutions such as UNISA engage with society in which they function and that they should strive to make a difference in the people's lives. Engaging with the community can be beneficial to all parties as they cooperate towards improving the lives of the citizen. And to this end, we would just also want to express as a college the, uh, uh, an appreciation of the collaborative relationship the college has had with the regional um, office 
here in KwaZulu Natal, the UNISA regional office here in Natal. They have been quite instrumental in establishing and opening up their networks precisely to make sure that the deliberations around this MOU are proceeding without any obstruction. UNISA representative at this ceremony include chairs of department, as I've said, as well as research professors. They will be part of the technical team meeting with staff at appropriate time. We have got special foc research focus teams as already established in the college, and these will be liaising with the provincial departments on how they can take the programs, research programs, capacity building programs through short learning programs in some case forward. The agreement is not only involving camps or College of Economic and Management Sciences, by virtue of it being an MOU between the Premier's office and the University of South Africa, it means all other colleges within the institution are basically co-signatories. And when the province needs assistance, they can easily and readily approach those colleges because they know there is already an existing framework that can facilitate such collaboration. So if you um, have issues around agriculture, we have the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, and that's the, the site from which some assistance can be sought. And similarly, with accounting sciences, we have a college, in, a college of accounting sciences which can provide such assistance and, and so on. So it is therefore an agreement that allows everyone to make a meaningful contribution to the improvement of socioeconomic conditions of our people and to reap the benefits from collaborations such as this. Part of the provisions of our MOU has been that we should um, provide platform for intellectual scholarly engagements. And this is where the JL Dube public lecture comes to the fore. And we are pleased that we have this inaugural lecture today. And we are pleased with the guest speaker who's going to be inaugurating this uh, public lecture because it is so appropriate uh, to have someone coming from the institution that JL Dube established to be that first person who speak and uh, provides us with the motivation of John Langalibalele Dube's life. And the theme for today, as has already been indicated, is promoting unity and human rights for community empowerment. And it is part of the UNISA 150 years of celebration. And we are also celebrating 151 years of John Langalivalele Dewey's legacy. Human rights are rights that everyone should have simply because they are human. Human rights for community empowerment is a continuous process to empower communities to recognize and ensure all communities and individual rights, including safety from all sorts of abuse and neglect, and that people realize their full potential to the, uh, to the fullest. Human rights development and in South Africa under the new democratic government only, can only be understood and appreciated against the historical background of colonialism and apartheid that we have got, come through. And as South Africans and Africans, we should be understanding this notion far more and therefore treat each other with the same respect and decorum that is required of people who have gone through a period of human rights abuse. The evolution of human rights is owed to the struggles within African states in the colonial and post-independent areas. As a result, human rights have been elevated as a matter that deserves the attention of African governments, African leaders, and African societies, as seen as a value that informs and inspires 
grassroots approaches to them. One of uh, Dr. J.L. Dubes' role was to advocate for and support communities in building networks of caring individuals to promote and to ensure individual rights through strong community empowerment. Dr. Dube was inspired to develop an initiative aimed at advancing the rights of black people. And we have gone through the various activities that he has done, the various programs, the various institutions that he has established, all of which demonstrate without fail how as an individual, within those many years, that, within those years that he lived, he actually made a contribution. And just this afternoon, this morning and afternoon, as we were taking a tour of the, uh, of Oshange and the tour of uh, the, the, the school and some of the initiatives, it became quite clear that uh, indeed his philosophy of making the hands work, making the brain work and think, and making heart to be sensitive is, is encapsulated. The spirit is evident as you walk through the streets and the corridors and the graveyard of that particular site. Because it, see, it comes across very openly that he was a holistic, he was holistic in his approach and his teachings were meant to cover the entire human being and not just one aspect of human uh, development. We think this public lecture should become a standard feature annually. And we have already discussed with the regional office that henceforth this be in the calendar of our public lecture circuit within UNISA. And we as the College of Economic and Management Scientists will be there to support them, will be there to give whatever in, uh, uh, advice we can to make sure that this legacy of the great man and the icon never fades away. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is my little uh, five cents worth of comments I have to make um, regarding the great works of this man that I can never cover for all what he has done in his life. And UNISA is quite proud to be hosting this public lecture to jointly with the province and jointly with the regional office of UNISA here in KwaZulu-Natal this evening. Thank you and uh, we wish you the best as we proceed in the coming years to come. Thank you. This afternoon, got on a and I would enjoy Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to call upon the son of this soil, initially a boy from Indo Edwe born and bred here. Indwetwe is part of Inanda, or Inanda is part of Indwetwe. So it is appropriate that Ungodosi uh, Ubaba Ujali is the one who is 
going to provide us with this very, very important keynote address on the life of Dr. J.L. Dube. May we rise up and welcome the keynote speaker of the evening in the name of Mr. Tabani Sbusiso Brian Jali. Mulos. Thank you, thank you, program director. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Uh, firstly, just to acknowledge uh, Her Excellency, the Premier of KwaZulu Natal, oh, Mrs. Nomusa Dube Nube. I'm not sure whether there are any members of, his, of her Executive Council who are here. If they are, all of them also, we do welcome them. And then also to welcome our special guests for tonight which is uh, the Dube family, and also usually the Dube family uh, travels together with the Ngobo family. Also to welcome them, the Dube family is being led by Ubaba Ulanga Dube, who's also the chairman of uh, the Dube, Dube Institute. And then Ngobo family here, I think they're with U Usonda and Ulunga. I haven't seen them, but I saw them during the day. The Vice Principal for Strategy, Risk, and Advisory Services at UNISA, Professor Ukeshan Lovu, Professor Tenjwe Meiwa, the Vice Principal for Research, Postgraduate Studies, Innovation, and Commercialization, Professor Matuku Thomas Mukhale, the Reserve Dean of the College of Economic and Financial Sciences, who Professor Unjabulo Mtize, who is the Acting Director and Chair of the UNISA College of Economic Education. I hope I'm correct. Who Professor Usmangaliso Kumalo. Well, before I say what he does, I think he is a, a, a well-known author and renowned researcher on Uch, 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 Dr. Dube. Unless you have read his books, you, you don't know much about Dr. Dube. And he is uh, the acting dean of School of Religion, Philosophy, and Classics at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Dr. Joyce uh, 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 Mieza, the regional director of KwaZulu-Natal. Kolani Dubazane, our program director, who is the deputy director of academic and technology support, UNISA Guazulu Natal. The executive management of UNISA, members of the Osanga High School Development Trust who are here, members of the John Dube Institute, members of the Osanga High School Alumni Association, executive committee who are led by U Chairman U Mr. Zandim Kize members of Osange governing uh, body, and then uh, the, ex uh, the ex uh, well, the members of the media who are here, the students of UNISA who are here, and the students of Osange, I know some of them are here, esteemed guests, and alumni of Osange High School, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. When U Professor Mkize asked me to talk about Uchon Dube, and uh, we had a long discussion, and I agreed. And then later we started uh, talking about how long the lecture was going to, to take. I indicated to him that, Prof, he did so much. I don't think the time you've given me will be enough to cover everything which John Dube did. And so much has been said about him today, but uh, I will try to 
to, to, to cover what I wanted to cover because he had a very industrious life. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honored and privileged to have the opportunity to deliver the very first inaugural lecture to honor, in, in honor of a great son of the soil, Dr. John Langalibale Dube, who amongst others, I'm sure once I start telling what he did, you'll realize why it was difficult. He was a minister of religion, an educationist, a politician, a media man, an author, a philanthropist, a community leader, and most importantly, a family man. So he was playing all those roles in his life. The story of uh, John Dube is a story which should be told to every child in South Africa, but in particular, black children. I think uh, our children need to hear the story. It is, it is a story of ambition, vision, values, devotion, fortitude, resilience, black excellence, and the ep epitome of uh, the struggle of black people for liberation. It is a story of a young man then who could have easily been satisfied with attending to family matters as it was the practice then or being satisfied with an education up to standard four as it was the government policy then. But instead, he chose a route which was less traveled. A route which ended up making him a trailblazer in education, politics, and media, and being influential in various facets of our lives. I believe it is a story every person should learn about because it is about transformation and about the black struggle for, the, for freedom, self-reliance, and economic emancipation. All of this was driven by his love for his people. He was, at the beginning of the 20th century, able to successfully traverse various sectors, and he was greatly adaptable. If I think about him and what he did, then I believe he would have easily adapted to this era of technology and the fourth industrial revolution which some of us are struggling with. Who is John Dube? Uh, a clip was played here telling you briefly who John Dube, John Dube was, and some of the speakers have already indicated briefly who John Dube was. I will touch on some of the aspects which will be relevant to my talk about who John Dube was. John Langalalwe Dube was born on the 11th of February, 1871, at Inanda Mission, uh, at Inanda. His father, the Reverend James Dube, died when he was six years old. So effectively, he was raised by a single parent. It was, must have been very difficult. That was in 1877. Before he commenced, that was before he commenced even his schooling. He only started school the following year after the death of his father at Inanda Mission. At the age of 10 years, he went to Adams College, which is a boarding school, which was about 50 kilometers away from his home, at the age of 10 years. In 1887, at the age of 16, he left South Africa for the United States of America with Reverend, Wilcox, uh, with, with Reverend William Wilcox. He studied at Oberlin College in Ohio, but returned to South Africa when he was 21, 21 years old. That is in 1892. I'm just highlighting the years to show how young he was when all of this was happening in, in his life. In 1894, he, he got married to Noctel Amdima who was a teacher at Inanda Seminary. The same year, 
he together with his new bride, Noctella, left Inanda Michin and went to start the Inwadi mission outside Peter Marisberg. Uh, another mission station outside Peter Marisberg. At age 24, in 1895, they left South Africa again for the United States. John Dube studied theology and Noctella studied, amongst others, music and domestic science. He graduated when he was 27 years old and he was ordained the following year as the Minister of Religion. They then returned to South Africa. He started Otlangi Institute in 1900, at the age of 29. When I think about what I was doing at 29, I, I, I just get amazed. Historians say then Utlange was officially opened on the 26th of July, 1901, as Utlange Institute. At the age of 32, he opened, he established Ilangana Senatal. That was in 1903. Following the untimely passing of Unoktela on the 26th of January, 1917, he married Angela in Kumalo on the 2nd of August, 1920. In 1936, he was awarded the Doctor of Philosophy, Honoris Causa, by the University of South Africa. In 1939, he was invited to become the ordinary president of the ANC and also a senior statesman within the ANC. And then he passed away on the 11th of February, 1946, which was on his birthday. I will touch briefly on the various facets of his life, which one way or the other had an impact on our lives. Minister of Religion, he was ordained as the Minister of Religion in 1899 by Reverend Robert J. Kent in Brooklyn, New York. This, was, this happened during his second visit to, to, the, to the United States. He then came back to South Africa to become a minister of uh, what is called now the United Congregational Church. I won't I want expand much on that particular role as the Minister of Religion, because there will be other speakers who will, who will tell you more about that particular aspect. But what I would like to mention is he was one of the very first preachers to talk about liberation theology, basically challenging the church to side with the oppressed majority in South Africa. As an then as an educationist, he founded Rosangi Institute in 1900, as I've already indicated, and he was its first principal. Prior to that, which I've since found out in my research, was that actually Rosangi was not the first school they established. There was an, a school they established at Tinwadi Mission. John Dube was also a published author he is recorded as having published six books. I won't go through all the books. Some of them were mentioned in some of the clips. But what was interesting is that the first book he published was in 1891, when he was 20 years old. He published his first book. The Media Man, I've already indicated, in 1903, he started Ilang Natal which was one, is one of the leading newspapers in the province or the country. Number four, the politician. He was the founding president of the Suffering Native Congress, which ended up being the, called the ANC, having been appointed in 1912. The Land Act of 1913 was promulgated by union government during his tenure as the ANC president. This had a major impact on his, on his presidency, and I'll deal with that later. Community leadership. John Duba was born of the Ngobo royalty, Uikadi, and therefore he had a royal lineage. His, 
His grandmother followed the religious route and left the royal household after the death of his grandfather. John Dube also followed the, relig the religious and academic rules, routes. Whilst following the ac academic route, route, he never turned his back on his people and traditional leadership. He kept his link with the Gadi and the Zulu royal houses. This was the lineage he was proud of and of which he made frequent references in his presentations, particularly the fundraising ones he used to do in the, in the United States of America. He later became an advisor or chief counselor to the Zulu king at the time, King Dinuzulu, and later the Russian prince, Prince Mishie Niga Dinuzulu. This was in one area where he tried to unite the urban or the educated blacks with the rural communities. He tried his best to pull together those sectors of the community. As I indicated, he was part of a number of civic organizations which were focusing on uplifting black people. I will just leave it at that and indicate that uh, in trying to uplift black people, he had obviously been influenced by Booker T. Washington when he was in the U.S. That's already been mentioned in one of uh, the presentations here. South Africa today, or oh, our constitutional democracy. I will now turn to look at Mafugzela in the current lens, being that of the constitutional democracy we are in. In other words, Mafugzela, the constitutional being, or should I say, the human rights and empowerment champion as the theme is about promoting unity and human rights for community empowerment. In starting that particular section, let me talk about what I observed in 1994. After casting his vote in his country of birth for the first time, President Nelson Mandela, who had chosen Oslange High School as his voting station, went to, to Dr. J. L. Dube's graveside and declared, Mr. President, I'm here to report that today South Africa is free. That's a very important statement. That's a very important statement and uh, uh, it's so important that I think even Professor Kumalo, in one of his books, he starts the book with that particular uh, uh, message coming from uh, 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 President Mandela. As I said, at the time I was the provincial electoral officer for the IEC, I was at Osange. To me, it was very significant. And it was a very emotional moment because of what Oshlange stood for in South Africa, in my personal life, and that of many of us. It was, and it, it was and still is a symbol of black pride, an institution we should protect to posterity. The action was of significance both in the African traditional sense and the constitutional sense because John Dube and the other stalwarts of his era had laid the foundation for where we, we found ourselves in 1994. Secondly, we have cast our votes and we are free, but it was the beginning of a very, of a very long, pro, uh, long constitutional journey in which we are still engaged even up to today. It's still going to be a long journey to settle and embed our constitutional democracy. So it was the beginning of this long journey. A general look at in the conduct of Uma Fugzela, who always wanted to emancipate the black, black people and free their minds from the shackles of oppression, to make us to be self-reliant and stand on our own and be counted amongst the respected nations of this world. Secondly, let us consider the various provisions of our constitution and particularly those which are aligned 
to Mafuku's the last journey in this world, Dube was a constitutional human being as early as 1900. Constitutions by their very nature record the history, suffering, experience, and the aspirations of most nations. If you want to understand where the nation is coming from, you must try to read their constitution. Then you will know what were their concerns. Similarly, our constitution clearly captured our history and what the founders of the nation were concerned about and were trying to address when drafting our constitution. John Dube was clearly concerned about the fundamental human rights of his people which were being violated on a daily basis. Because of that, he did everything within his power to try and address the said uh, violations. It was more his actions which will make one without doubt to say he was a constitutional being or a human rights champion. In his approach to socio-political change, challenges in South Africa, Dube was greatly influenced by his training as a minister of religion Booker T. Washington, and his exposure to the United States, I may say, and America's approach to human rights and the Constitution. His first visit to the U.S. was in 18, 1887, which was exactly 22 years after the 13th Amendment had been passed to the Americans, the 13th Amendment to the, to the American, American Constitution had been passed. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, slavery. So he got to the United States 22 years after slavery had been abolished. And I think he, he observed this community in transition. He observed what had happened suddenly to all those blacks who had previously been regarded as slaves in the U.S. I, I think I can uh, 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 suggest maybe that started playing on in, in his mind that it is possible to change South Africa. Change South Africa for the better. Here was this young, intelligent mind. He was going to be unstoppable on his quest or journey now to try and see that uh, our society is transformed, having observed all of this and had all the influences I've touched upon. What emerged from all of this was a John Dube who generally demonstrated fortitude, resilience, patience and diplomacy in his role as a leader. He was a visionary and also a pragmatic leader, a leader who also wanted to promote unity and deliver on his mandate whenever he was leading his people. According to Prof. Kumalo, he saw his role in society as a leader of his people, as a colleague from God. Let's discuss what he did thereafter. I would like to focus or talk in detail about John Dube, the politician, the media man, and educationist. As I indicated, it would be difficult to cover almost all the facets of his life. And how we promoted unity, empowerment, and self-reliance of black people and human rights in these areas. The strategy being to empower the individual through education, the communities through self-reliance and ultimately liberate the nation. I think that was the underlying strategy. Firstly, John Dube, the politician. I would like to visit John Dube, the politician, as his le leadership contributed immensely to what gave birth to a constitutional democracy. John Dube was elected in absentia at the founding
as the founding president of uh, the South African National uh, Congress on the 8th of January 1912 in Bloemfontein. Because the delegates had recognized his leadership skills, which he had displayed in, amongst others, Otlange, Ilanga, in fundraising, traditional leadership matters, and other areas. They believe he could advance the noble cause of the black struggle in South Africa. Interestingly, Deputy President Paul Mashatile states that two other equally capable candidates, Edward Tseu and Sifago Mahatu, deferred this honor to lead the Congress to John Dube. This indicates the respect that he commanded and enjoyed among his, amongst his peers. The SANCC conference in Bloemfontein had agreed that the purpose of the Congress was one, to promote unity and cooperation between African people and the Union government, two, to promote Africans' social, economic, and political development, and three, to incorporate chiefs more fully into the political affairs of the nation. It was also agreed that the Constitution will be drafted in, in a later stage. I'll get back to these points later. He accepted the leadership role, even though he already had multiple other commitments. His desire to bring unity and help to bring about the liberation of the black person was too strong for him not to accept this role. In accordance with his mandate, he traveled the length and breadth of the country addressing various st stakeholders in order to promote unity. He explaining the rationale for the organization, the mandate they had received from Bloemfontein, and also opposing uh, the various government projects which were in place at the time. Maybe it might be important for us in this day and age where we do have a, a constitutional democracy to remember that political organizing at the time was not easy. The environment was not conducive to opposing the government and the laws were oppressive. You needed permission from the local magistrate to call political meetings. Traveling around the country was very difficult. Communication was not as easy as it is today. There were no cell phones. And the government was banning meetings at random. For example, the second meeting of the Congress was banned, which was scheduled to be in Gauteng, but had to be moved to Kimberley. Dube was detained on one of these trips at Van Rinden Pass on his way to address a meeting in Bloemfontein. Because he didn't carry an outward pass, that's what the authorities said. White authorities were just not used to blacks who questioned their authority. That was the environment. With the benefit of hindsight and the, and the context of this lecture, I would like to, to examine the impact of his leadership of the Congress. The Congress was a newly formed national organization. The administrative and setting up challenges for any national organization can never be underestimated. Within a year of his election, the Lou, the Lou Botha regime promulgated the Land Act, which didn't help much. He had to engage on the matter, make representations, and petition the Botha government on this particular matter. The challenges which were faced by the Congress at the time are best described by advocate Tembeka Ngugaitobi in his book, The Land is Ours, when he writes about Usal Bim Simango, who was a lawyer uh, in the leadership of uh, the Congress, who interestingly happened to be one of the very first law, uh, students, uh, first five students who were at, at Rotlange. Simango was appointed chairman of the Constitutional Drafting Committee of the, of, of, of the SANNC. From that moment, his life took a different trajectory as he became an activist as well as a lawyer. The Congress, which had been found, founded 
to advance the interest of Africans had to go beyond political method, methods, as Selby Msimango explained. You see, the ANC was unfortunate. It was established in 1922. In 1913, before it had circled it as an organization, perhaps drawn up its plans to organize and run the whole show, the government introduced the land bill, which was a great sensation. It meant that every effort must be made to fight against the bill. So every one of us, some of us had to give up our jobs and go out organizing, explaining to the people what this new bill contained, and eventually we decided to send a deputation to England in protest after the government had passed the bill. That's, what, that's how Selbin Simangos described the environment. John Dube and the Congress leadership made representations to the senators in Cape Town, to members of parliament in Cape Town, and met the Minister of Native Affairs more than four times to discuss the Land Act and its effects on the black population, namely the disposition of land, the livestock was getting killed and dying, and a whole lot of other challenges. John Dube eventually had to lead a delegation of the Congress leaders to England to protest about the act to the British government. All these representations were rebuffed by the English, including their longtime ally, the Anti-Slavery and Aborigines Protection Society. In his book, again, Tembagan Nwagaitobi explained, Ignored by the British government and abandoned by its erstwhile supporters, the Congress faced a choice. They could press ahead with their mission or return to South Africa. In deciding the latter, another problem emerged. They had no money to travel back home. It was back to the very society which had rejected them that they had to turn to for assistance. When the Congress delegation returned to South Africa, the world was in a state of war. First World War had begun, as it began on the 28th of July, 1914. That war, the First World War, pitted the global powers against each other, that is Germany versus Britain. The allegiances of the Dutch and the English-speaking people of South Africa were split down the middle. Now, there was a bigger problem which was facing South Africa, the land issue, which had been the biggest issue for blacks, which is still a big issue even now, became secondary. It will therefore appear that in light of their foregoing, the issue of the natives' grievance about the land became secondary to the union government. I can't see any leader who had succeeded in challenging the Land Act and other oppressive laws which were passed by the Union government under these conditions because the Second World War carried on for the next four years until 1980, the First World War until 1918. I said I will talk about the, the Land Act had a big impact on uh, his leadership as you can see. It took a lot of the the time of the, the leadership of the ANC at the time. Now on his political views, John Dubo was a true leader of the people. Once again, at an early age of 23 years, without holding any political office, he showed his mettle by not being afraid to speak truth to power. Whilst he was at Ingwa Dimission Station, he protested in the local newspaper about how the local white magistrate were treating black litigants in their courts. Some of them were demeaning Africans by forcing them to crawl on their hands and knees before them. This was blatant racism and violation of people's dignity. He could not let it go unchallenged, so he took up that particular fight at the age of 23. John, Dube, John Dube's political views 
amongst others, were influenced by his Christian background as an ordained minister of religion. He was moderate, he was a moderate leader because he espoused the values of unity. His moderate approach to issues also comes across in his writings. He was constantly pleading for engagement with white people. If you read his many uh, uh, letters and publications, he was constantly saying, let's talk, let's engage. In various addresses, he was very intentional though, even though he was pleading, he was very intentional about pronouncing the three cardinal principles, that there should be no legislation without representation, no administration without representation, no taxation without representation. The issue of representation for black people was his main point of contention, as evidenced in many of his speeches and publications. Even on the issue of, of the Land Act, he gave the impression that representation in Parliament was the underlying bone of contention, thus the drive to want to go and meet the king in England. The third contention about taxation gained, gained prominence later. This urge may have been as a result of the influence of the Bambata Rebellion of 1906 and the subsequent in incarceration of King Dinizu. I'll deal with those two later. In his address to the missionary conference in, 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 at the Devon City Hall, he pleaded for a cooperative governance with the government, for the government to take their leaders into confidence and have and have some attached to the Office of the Native Affairs Department as consultative representatives of the natives, natives in administrative questions. He concluded his address by stating that, I do most earnestly plead for the patience of the white people towards us and for greater consideration for the country's legislators. Clearly, this approach would not have settled well with some of the leaders of his movement in later years. Who would have, who would have label, labeled this as too accommodating, as people were getting more radical? But it was the nature of the politics at the time and the man John Dube, as I've already indicated what his influence was. In the same address, he also raised concerns about court, the, court, the court descending kindness of white people towards black people. He went on to express his views on the treatment of black employees by their white employers. He starts by, 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 by saying how loyal the black workers are to their employers, and then went on to say, I quote, to draw attention to the fact that in many instances on labor field, many people are shockingly accommodated, badly cared for, badly paid, and I submit that it is for the government to take immediate action. Now and again, what is happening will peep out in the courts and in the press. He went on further to question the fairness of the laws governing black people who, and also in that uh, contention and that challenge, his main trust was the issue about representation to say even the laws Black people have, got, have had no representation in the making of uh, those uh, laws. And uh, indicating that the voice of the black people is needed as insofar as uh, the making of the laws is concerned. And uh, in closing, again, pleading in earnest that there should be no legislation without representation, including no taxation without representation. So that was a constant and intentional message he kept on driving. Clearly, if I read this, I say to myself, John Dube was concerned about equality, labor practices, that is a right to fair labor practice, basically the freedoms which are enshrined in our constitution in terms of section nine and section 23 of our constitution. So he was clearly a human rights champion and a human rights defender. Constitutional, constitutional rights, 
like most legal principles, do evolve with time. The constitutional jurisprudence should not be out of step with the dynamic and, evo in, and evolving fa fa fabric of our society. Similarly, the political views of our political scholars, lawyers, politicians should also evolve with time. With the benefit of hindsight, some of the views may have needed some refinement in today's context, but he was correct on the fundamental principles. He was also very concerned about racial harmony in the country and protested that there is nothing in the whole Bible to show the superiority in the white skin or that a man born of kinky hair and dark complexion is not just as worthy as any other man. So he raised racial issues as well. John Dewey was a one-time president of uh, the Congress as a, he, didn't, he, he was voted out in the 1917 conference. According to some historians, there was a view that uh, as no leader is perfect, that he was an accommodationist and gradualist in his approach to the land issue, and he was not radical enough. I agree with Professor Kumalo that such accusations are misplaced, and they stem from the critics' misunderstanding of his theology of liberation and decolonization. Firstly, Leadership is not about pleasing all people all the time. You have to stand for what is right, whether it is a popular view or an unpopular view. You should do the right thing or ethical thing, whether you will win the election or not. I know it's difficult, but that's what ethical leadership is about. Secondly, the missing point in this criticism is the context of the engagements at the time and what his mandate was from Bloemfontein Conference. I said I will get back to the mandate, to what the purpose of the conference in Bloemfontein was. The purpose of the conference was one, to promote unity and cooperation between African people and the union government. Two, to promote Africans social, economic, and political development. Three, to incorporate chiefs more fully into the political affairs of the nation. John Dube complied with, with his mandate. That was his mandate from Bloemfontein, and he complied with it. When you observe everything that John Dube did during his lifetime, you read his publications, it is apparent that he had an independent mind. The independence of his mind was also demonstrated in his interaction with missionaries. But I'll leave somebody who's going to talk about religion to talk about that. Some of the historians have made some observations. Heather Hughes, in her book, The First President, even suggests that the missionaries may have been of the view that he came across as too confident for his age. That's why I said I'll talk about his age so that you can see how much he achieved at a very uh, uh, young age. Clearly, if he had an independent mind, he would have ruffled some feathers in the various facets of his life he was engaging in because people want people who conform and uh, they don't want somebody who comes up sometimes with an independent mind. In his book, Pastor and Politician, Prof. Kumalo says at the end of it all, Dube was radical to the white people of his era and was judged as a gradualist by the radicals within the African National Congress. There are numerous examples of him raising these sensitive political issues with the authorities as a leader of the people. I've already touched on some, and I'm still going to touch on more as this pro progresses. In any leadership role, you will have conflicting interests, and there is always a struggle in balancing them. John, John Dube didn't only have 
the challenge of balancing the, very, the, the various forces of factions within the ANC, but also balancing the interests of Oslange Institute and the organization. The latter stressed, stressed, stressed him a lot. Not, notwithstanding the numerous challenges that John Dube and the uh, SANCC leadership encountered, including the uncapped promises received from the Union government on the Land Act, he showed fortitude and resilience. I'm, I'm saying this because there were a number of promises which they were given, were given to them as the delegation when they spoke to the various ministers that things will be, will be amended, more land will be given to blacks, let's wait for the Buement Commission to finish its work, then I will address all these issues. So there were promises which were never kept. Notwithstanding all of that, he was able to keep the, the very young organization together and ensured that it did not dissipate as some of the members of the union government had hoped. He maintained unity within the Congress. The organization ended up being a formidable force to challenge the very government for power. For power, no longer for representation, for power now. It became a formidable force to challenge for power. I will submit that John Dube's leadership was visionary, strategic, pragmatic, and purposeful. The conducts of the time should not be ignored. Petitions were the way of politics at the time, and they were taken seriously by the authorities. He was set on dialogue with, with the white government in South Africa, as directed by the Bloemfontein Conference. Dube's message was about racial tolerance, engagement with whites at the time, and reconciliation. Dube, same as Lutuli and others, were focused on negotiations, exactly where we ended up as a country in 1991 with our Codessa negotiations. They had foresight and they were ahead of their time. And they were not the problem, but the government was the problem as it didn't want to enter into bona fide negotiations. It had to be pushed to go into bona fide negotiations. We all know how the government was pushed to enter into bona fide negotiations in the end. In all of the union government's communications to John Jube, they were even disputing, disputing whether he represented the all blacks in South Africa. I suppose there was no better way to verify that at that time except by democratic elections, which the government avoided until 1994. Eventually, the 1994 general elections confirmed the ANC representation and proved John to be right. So he was vindicated. At the time he wrote to the government, he was representing blacks in South Africa. I've covered John Dube, the, pol the politician, and I think I, I've indicated what I think of his leadership, which was very visionary leadership. Now, I'd like to proceed to consider John Dube the media man. Once again, he demonstrated his visionary leadership and the love of his people. The development in cases relating to the First Amendment to the United States Constitution would have left an impression on John Dube and shaped his views on the freedom of expression and, in, and its importance in upholding democratic values. That is, whilst he was in the USA. Ilang Alassane Natal was a weekly newspaper which started publishing on the 10th of April, 1903. Its first edition, editor was John Dube. It covered current events, social news, debates, and other areas. The newspaper undertook to open the eyes of the people to their own best interest. In essence, it covered topics to improve people's lives. At the time, there was no other Zulu newspaper. He realized the importance of communicating with our people by disseminating information 
and educating them about the world issues in their own language. He started Ilanga during an era of thought control. The government was controlling everything, which uh, they thought uh, 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 we were trying to control everything. They wanted even to control how you, th you thought and what you wrote. One cannot underestimate the importance of the media in any struggle for liberation. Dube had identified that as a need. Section 16 of, our, of the South African Constitution directs us to promote the freedom of expression. It stipulates that everyone has a right to freedom of expression, which includes freedom of the press and the media, freedom to receive and, or import information or ideas. This is to ensure that the debate on public issues is uninhibited, robust, and wide open. John Dume may have heard these views when he founded Ilang. He may have been ahead of his time in his thinking. It was only after the 1994 transition that our constitutional court, in its seminal judgment, upheld this right. It said, in Kumalo and others versus Olomisa, the print, broadcast, and, electro and electronic media have a particular role to play in the protection of freedom of expression in our society. Every citizen has a right to freedom of the press and the media and the right to receive information and ideas. The media are key agents in ensuring that these aspects of the right of freedom of expression are respected. This judgment clearly confirmed the role of the media in our society. What John Dube stood for as early as 1903, it was only confirmed in South Africa in 1994. Ilanga provided black people with some freedom to express their views through, though limited at the time because of the oppressive laws as it provided a platform to exchange views and also to challenge the government because political issues, because political issues uh, uh, were debated in an, in, in, an, in an open forum. Freedom of expression is fundamental or pivotal to any functioning of a, any democracy. At the, time, at, the time, at the time, getting to the constitutional democracy was aspirational for our leaders, like John Dube. The importance of this fundamental right has been recognized worldwide. For example, it's also been, uh, uh, it's also been recognized in uh, the USA and in Australia. In a, a seminal case in the USA, in New York Times versus Sullivan, it was stated that the freedom of expression was fashioned, was fashioned to assure unfettered interchange of ideas for the bringing about of political and social change desired by the people. And the, the Supreme Court went on to say, the right conclusions are more likely to be gathered out of a multitude of tongues than through any kind of, of authoritative selection of what gets reported and not reported. So it is important. Similarly, in Australia, the Australian High Court said the freedom of the citizen to engage in significant political communication and discussion is largely dependent upon the freedom of the media. The United, the United Nations, in Article 19 of the International Convent of, on Civil and Political Rights, also recognizes this right the freedom of expression. Clearly, John Dube was a promoter of human rights and he was a champion of the freedom of speech. This being demonstrated by the venture into the media space as early as 1903 at the age of, at the age of 32 years. He was in a venture to seek truth, the truth, disseminate information and promote debate in society. The intention, of course, being eventually to liberate the people. During the Bambata Rebellion of 1906, 
in response to the passing of the Poll Tax Act, he utilized the pages of Ilanga to voice his grievance and through this to support the rebellion. He detested the taxation without representation for black people. That message was carried through in most of his speeches and uh, the pages of uh, Ilanga Lasse Natal. There is an article, which, uh, an editorial which he published, which was basically questioning why the Poll Tax Act, the Poll Tax Act was passed without a representation. I'm not going to quote that, just to give you briefly what, what, what he said. As a result, he also used the newspaper to defend Uking Dinuzulu when he was accused of being behind the Bambata Rebellion and faced 23, 23 counts of high treason. He strongly believed that his prosecution was unfair and a travesty of justice, particularly because there was no consultation on the imposition of poll tax and the high-handed manner in which King Dinuzulu had been arrested by the authorities. Interestingly, when Louis Botha became the Prime Minister, he pardoned King Dinuzulu on the 31st of May 1910. As Louis Botha believed his trial after the Bambata rebellion was unfair. Once again, John Dube's position was vindicated. And uh, King Dinuzulu was subsequently released. That to me confirms John Dube's character and leadership, speaking truth to power even when it was difficult. He stood by what he believed was right. The pages of Ilanga were also used to oppose the three Natal native bills. This campaign against the bills had led to him being warned by the authorities that he was playing with fire. But notwithstanding that, he carried on writing in the newspaper opposing those bills. In whatever he did, his philosophy on self-reliant was never forgotten. The Ilanga newspaper was printed by the students of Otlange for quite some time. They learned the important printing skill, amongst others, through printing the Ilanga newspaper. To Dube, Ilanga was not solely a business venture, but he had a bigger purpose, namely to educate our people and to eventually take them out of subjugation and restore their dignity and pride as they produced their own paper in their own language. Later, he tried to revive the Native Press Association, which was to share ideas and look into the interests of the various independent black papers across the whole of South Africa. There were a number of independent black papers across the country. If you all recall, the very first one was in Zabanzundu, which was published in the Cape. I will submit that John Dube was a highly conscientized black person. He was continuously picking up causes to uplift and unite black people. John Dube, the educationist, I will now turn to deal with his other calling of venture, which is also a testament to his commitment to human rights and empowerment of his people. He founded the Otlange Institute in 1900, Noktel Amdima, his wife, supported him a lot in this project. He was the principal and Noktel was, amongst the others, a music, a music teacher. The strong music tradition at Osange is the logos of Noktel and others. The school attract, attracted teachers from the African continent, students from all, all corners of South Africa. The school had been built with his personal funds and the support of a number of international donors, particularly from the United States of America. His decision to build Oshlange Institute had been inspired by his visit to Tuskegee Institute in Alabama during his second study visit to the US. 
I stand here tonight in front of you with modesty and gratitude as one of the products and recipients of his commitment towards human rights and human development. As one of the former students of Utlange High School, I can clearly say his legacy and teachings on self-reliance of, bl uh, of black people and service to our people left an indelible mark in our lives. John Dube started Othlange Institute, as it was then known, in 1900, in response to the South African government's very oppressive policy or law against black ch children so that they could keep them in bondage forever. Othlange Institute was black-owned and black-led boys and girls industrial and academic school. The board of trustees was black and only later were some white trustees appointed to be part of the trust. Those trustees who were, I think, affectionately referred to as uh, Amakati Amshlope, who I think aligned themselves with what uh, uh, Amakati stood for, or black people stood for Amakati. The vision for Oshlange, as intended and announced by John Dube, was that the school will teach the hand to work, the brain to understand, and the heart to serve. It was to offer a holistic education, both industrial and academic. Thus, the curriculum at Oshlange met this ideal, covering academics, practical skills, and spiritual education and the aim to grow a black person so that he could stand for himself or herself. Othlange was affectionately known as the Tuskegee of South Africa because of, amongst others, what it produced for black South Africans compared to what Tuskegee College in the U.S. produced for African Americans. The historians assert that an American missionary remarked that at Othlange, I quote, Bo boys gave up their liberty to go to school, whereas girls found it there. These comments may have been informed, informed by the observation of how the school was run by John Dube and his team. John Dube's commitment to liberty of everyone, including women, was one of the legacies which were carried through at Othlange. He was committed to gender equality and the upliftment of women. There were a number of female, there were a number of female teachers, at, even at a very early stage at Othlange. This culture was maintained and supported even by those leaders who came after John Dube to lead the school. No wonder. It was Othlange High School, which had three female cabinet ministers at, at some stage in the South African cabinet. Namely, Minister Pumzile Mlambo, Nuga, Togo Didiza, and Lindwe Hendrickson. One of whom Pumzile Mlambo Ngube ended up being the first deputy president, female deputy president of the country. One former Othlange high school female student once commented that she had been a student in other boarding schools and she never looked forward to going back to school after holidays. But when she was at Othlange, she enjoyed the school so much that she used to look forward to going back to school, even when she was at home. Definitely, her soul was liberated at Othlange, as observed by the American missionary who had commanded. John Dube built Othlange Institute, notwithstanding the discouragement and the criticism he was subjected to, for example, that uh, he was de deceiving people to steal their money when he was asking for donations. He persisted with his vision of uplifting the black child. 
anyone else could have been easily discouraged, particularly as the environment or the political system had everything against a black person. The government of the day and other South Africans do not believe in, social in racial equality, and to them, blacks could not achieve what John Dube wanted to achieve. Uh, wanted to achieve it as a result, some saw John Dube as a bad influence or an instigator of some sort. Unfortunately, he was a progressive person and way ahead of them in terms of understanding equality and basic human rights. For Dube, industrial education was not a substitute for intellectual knowledge. The two had to go together, for they were both important if black people were to be fully independent. That is, according to Professor Kumalo in one of his books. On the industrial side of the school, there were workshops, and students were taught technical skills and agriculture. It is very interesting, for, it's very much interesting for me that in 2003, Osange High School is making a full cycle uh, and uh, it's opening up workshops to offer technical education. So we're going back to where John Dube was because we've suddenly realized that that is the skill which is needed in this country. So he was ahead of his time again. John Dube's successful efforts were, not, were a threat to the government of the day Members of the special branch of the police were even sent to Otlang and other places to monitor his actions. Dube was stranded a number of times by the government officials that they would close Ilangala Senatal and Otlang. Dube never received any financial support from the government for Otlang for years, but he relied on donations, school fees, self help projects to fund the school. Otlang students had to produce agricultural products to contribute towards the sustainability of Atlanga, Mafukuzala was planting the seed of self-reliance or philosophy, which was meant to ultimately liberate our people. In spite of the odds, Atlanga survived and transformed a number of lives because John Dube understood education to be a human right. The former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, pronounced education is a human right with immense power to transform. On its foundation rests the cornerstone of freedom, democracy, and sustainable human development. Post-1994, there is a constitutional provision to address education, which is section 29 of our constitution, which basically says everyone has a right to basic education including uh, adult basic education. The right to education has been recognized in a number of judgments in our courts, particularly the constitutional courts and international instruments. For example, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. The International Covenant on Economic and Cultural Rights through the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights monitors social economic rights, including the right to education. It has issued comments giving content to that right, that is the right of education, stressing its importance. General, general comment 13 states, education is both, both a, human right, a, human right, a human right in itself and an indispensable means of realizing other human rights. As an empowerment right, education is the primary vehicle by which economically and socially marginalized adults and children can lift themselves out of poverty and obtain the means to participate fully in their communities. Secondly, education is a vital role in empowering women, safeguarding children from exploita exploitative and hazardous labor and sexual exploitation. Promoting human rights and democracy 
protecting the environment and controlling population growth. Thirdly, increasingly, education is recognized as one of the best financial investments states can make. Fourthly, but the importance of education is not just practical. A well-educated, enlightened, and active mind, able to wander freely and widely, is one of the jobs and rewards of human, of human existence. Close the quote. John Dube, in 1900, already recognized this and understood this. The vast majority of schools in then Natal province complied with the government's policy of providing education to blacks, to black children, only up to standard four. It was only a handful of schools which did not comply. John Dube's Oshang High School was one of them. This was of major concern to the authorities one might suspect that the concern would have been informed by the stereotype of racism at the time. The Sangha teachers were predominantly black, and thus the question would have been, would they be in a position to teach certain subjects? Fortunately, the staff and the curriculum at Sangha was equipped for that, and the teachers were well qualified and very much committed to the upliftment of the black child. In this role, John Duba made a great contribution in the development of the great nation. His great work in building Osangi Institute influenced great South Africans like S.D. Ngobo, R. Goba, and uh, V.G. Sangweni to join the school to promote and protect the legacy of Mafuguzel. Mr. S.D. Ngobo, who in our generation of students was the principal, constantly reminded us as students about Mafugzala's vision and his contribution to the upliftment of our people. He, he instilled the culture of service to the people and to be proud as Africans. It is not surprising that he carried through the teachings of both Dr. Dube and Mrs. Noctala Dube in running the school and motivating the students. It was not uncommon for schools to have challenges insofar as water, food, and electricity is concerned. Whereas in other boarding schools, such challenge led to students rioting or damaging property. At Oslanga, when that happened, the students were reminded of Mafugzela's sacrifice to build the school and the greater purpose of why the students were there, to liberate their minds and eventually liberate themselves. As a result, such complaints or protests, as they also did occur, hardly led to any malicious damage to property or arson, as it was common in other places. The point about John Dube's vision and sacrifice was always emphasized by Mrs. Angela Dube as well, who throughout her life promoted the legacy of John Dube. Earlier, I spoke about the continuous threats from the authorities to close Osange. In 1960, they actually took the decision to close Osange and convert it to a men's hostel. If it wasn't for the foresight and sacrifice of Mr. S. D. Ngobo, there will be no Oshlange High School today. He rejected a promotion to be an inspector of schools and offered his services to head Oshlange High School. He successfully turned Oshlange around and thus preserved and promoted the legacy of John Dube. That is a story for another day. As indicated earlier, Osanga High School ended up producing some of the great leaders of this great, great country of ours who have helped in the development of our great nation. Just to quote a few, uh, the whole, there's a whole list. I, I'm just going to quote two. 
the first black president of the Methodist Church, Oseth Mokidima, is an ex Oshange student. Chief Albert Lutul is an ex Oshange uh, student. As I've already touched on the three ministers and the first deputy president, ex Oshange student. There are numerous of them. Uh, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the entire list. If it wasn't for his vision in building a school for the black child, this country would have been poorer. This even, and the, the name, of course, Mafugzela, the one over Fuguza, which means he worked extremely hard to uplift the black child. To those who admired his great contribution in education, empowerment, and nation building, uh, affectionately refer to him as Umafuguzela Unjengezul. Dube was aware of what Oshlange had achieved, and he constantly argued for the value of Oshlange's education model. In one of his writings, he said, I quote, I disagree with the theory that you can spoil a native by giving him the best education. I've been connected with the education of the youth ever since I founded Oshlange Institute. Through that institute, the they have passed men in all important walks of life in South Africa, and they are the pride and product of the best in the Western education. South Africa today, as I've already indicated, can attest to that. As I already indicated, the historians have sort of confirmed that Oshanga was not the first school John Dube built. He and Noctella also built schools at Inwadi, the one called Ijubane Primary School and the other one Inwadi Secondary. And they also built a church in 1894. I think it stayed for a year or two in Inwadi, but that's the amount of work they did there before they went back to the States. At the time, he was only 23 years old. I, once again, I think about what I was doing at 23, I just get amazed. So much for their commitment to education and the upliftment of a black child. In one of the lectures on John Dube and his achievements and, and his actions, particularly his approach to self-reliance by Africans, he was compared to Steve Biggs' Black People's Convention. That is, at all times, trying to ensure that there is a self-respect in black people. South Africa has had a number of education systems pre and post-1994. Even post-1994, whilst not racially segregated, we have tried and tested different systems which, which have not been successful on literacy and numerical skills. According to a number of academics or researchers, for example, the recent several international benchmark assessments reports for the past two decades published by the Center for Development and Enterprise, stating that 78% of grade four pupils can read for meaning in any language. And also, South Africa, according to Professor L. Pritchard in the same reports, South Africa is the biggest lending underperformer relative to GDP per capita. When I read those reports, I suddenly realized that if John Duba was alive, he, he would have been disappointed by these reports and sought a solution to address this because we can't allow this to happen to our nation. John Duba at the turn of the century was in a position to find and develop what Sange, to produce good and useful citizens to become true leaders of our nation. He was interested in, in educating the black children so that they can contribute positively to the economy as it was at the time. I have no doubt, being the visionary and pragmatic leader he was, he was, if he was alive today and had to start Oshlange all over, he would have designed a school to address some of the challenges I've already referred to and also to contribute towards the fourth industrial revolution and the technical skills which are greatly needed in our country. As things start, currently stand, we are destroying the legacy of John Dube as a nation, and everything he stood for. 
Whilst we are always proud to remember that President Mandela cast his vote at Oslanga in 1994, maybe we should stop and remember what he said about education. He said, I quote, education is the great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become a head of a mine, that a child or a farm worker can become the president of a great nation. It is what we make out of what we have, not what we are given, that separates one person from another. Furthermore, the one lesson we can learn from John Dube is that we should serve our people with respect and discharge our duties as a responsible and patriotic citizen. As the principal and the founder of the school, Mafugzela was hands-on, was a hands-on leader and in full control of the affairs of the school and continuously fundraising to ensure the sustainability of the school. Lastly, I will submit that Oslange was one of John Dube's greatest achievements and contribution to South Africa in terms of community empowerment. I indicated earlier that he was also involved in a number of community projects. Just briefly, he was a community leader through his life and belonged to a number of civic organizations. He was also a farmer and he was very much interested in land matters. He strongly believed, and rightly so, that land acquisition will empower people. He, together with Reverend Wilcox and others, were part of a company called the Zulu Industrial Improvement Company, which was formed in 1908. The sole purpose of the company was to purchase land for the benefit of black people. This effort did not last long as they did not gather support. And there were numerous challenges, including the colonial government's draconian laws on the acquisition of land by black people. The land issue was central to our struggle for freedom. And John Duba was committed to getting land back for black people. The land issue is intertwined with the very issue of economic empowerment or freedom. Unless this issue is addressed, we'll continuously have problems in our country. John Dube tried to address the issue of land with the limited resources he had. In the same vein, as the self-help philosophy which drove him to establish Oslange and Ilangalasa Natal, this project was an attempt to empower blacks so that they could be self-reliant. Notwithstanding the above efforts and those of other South Africans, the land issue is still a sore point in our country and it needs attention. The majority of the land is still in the hands of the minorities in South Africa. In South Africa today, we have a number of constitutional structures to address the land issue. That is, Land Registration Commission, the Land Claims Court, the High Court, the Constitutional Court. Section 24 of our Constitution enjoins or directs us to address the land issue in a clear and judicious manner. Notwithstanding that, not a single case on land has found its way to our constitutional court. And the constitutional judges have been waiting to say when is it coming through so that they can pronounce in section 25 so that we are all clear as what needs to be done. I believe Mapufugzala would have, amongst others, taken the land issue to the constitutional court to try and empower his people as that is what he believed in. in even before they went to England as a, the deputation with Sol Plaki and the others, they had exhausted all the constitutional remedies which were available in South Africa at the time, limited as they were, but they exhausted all of them, limited as they were. They ensured that they exhausted that before, the, before they took the next step. So the land issue really, I think he would have taken it to where it should have been taken by now. In conclusion, I'd like to say 
I've covered a number of facets of Dr. John Dewey's life, which clearly show him as a constitutional being, as I was, asked, I was asked in terms of the theme of this lecture. In my presentation, I also touched on how I thought he might have reacted to some of the challenges we are currently facing as a country. Clearly, a lot has been written about Mafuguzela, but I think on these three particular facets of his life, we need to do more as our country is bleeding and our children are screaming for leadership from us to address all sorts of challenges that we as a country are facing. John Dube in his pra pragmatic, visionary and patriotic leadership had laid foundation, had laid a foundation for us. We can build on that foundation a great and successful nation for the, for, for the future of our children. Like John Dube, we should seek solutions to address the challenges we are facing as a country. Othanga Institute and Ilangalasa Natale were solutions to the problems he had, he had identified at the turn of the century. He succeeded in educating the black child against the will of the government at the time and to ensure that the unpopular or minority views were had through Ilang Alassane Natal. Achieve, achieving the very important objective of, of free speech, because of his belief in self-help by, black, by blacks and the love for his people and wanting to liberate them, uh, uh, I submit that if he was still alive, he would have definitely had address the land issue, especially with all the resources at his disposal as a leader. He tried to empower his people when he had very little. Everything he did was, empower, was about empowering his people. The list of our challenges is endless. Our response should not be limited to acknowledging them that there are problems. We should be providing solutions that is what the children of South Africa expect from us as their parents and leaders. John Dube would have looked for solution. This is one important lesson we can learn from John Dube's leadership. He did everything he did whilst he was continuously being discouraged when building Othlange and later being advised to stay away from politics as it might damage Othlange. He loved his people so much that he continued notwithstanding those concerns about what his involvement in other ventures might do to Othlange. The Lagos of Mafuzela could have been easily forgotten. We thank the University of South Africa, firstly, for rec recognizing his work in 1946 and honoring him with an honorary doctorate. Secondly, for thinking about him once again with this commemorative public lecture. It could not have happened at any better time as when UNISA is celebrating 150 years of his existence and contributing to the education of our nation. It is also another institution which has produced leaders for South Africa and is generally committed to excellence. UNISA and Dr. J.L. Dube share a common goal, which is to define and shape our tomorrow or future through education. I also thank the provincial government of KwaZulu Natal for their support. You are always very supportive of all projects to promote education in the province. We would appeal that the legacy of John Dube should always be promoted by the provincial government. He is the son of the soil, after all. As I indicated earlier, our children have to learn about our patriots. Uh, those are our heroes and they should learn about them. They end up trying to identify heroes from uh, people who are not necessarily our heroes. Dube was an ordinary young man who left the comfort of his home at the age of 10 years to seek an education to improve his life and, that, uh, and his condition and that of his people, whom he loved so much. A true patriot who was also a visionary and pragmatic leader in my view. 
I wish we could all emulate John Dube and do so much for our nation. I do hope that this lecture will be a positive contribution to the journey to promote everything John Dube stood for. We should promote his legacy and pick up the spear where Noctella Dube, Angeline Dube, Charles Dube, John Mdima, Inko Sumkawe Ngobo, Reverend Wilcox, Mr. S. D. Ngobo, Mr. Nsithele, Mr. Tuli, Mr. Vig Vigi Sanguini, Usi and Agumalo, the current principal, and others in education, in politics, in media, in religion, and other spheres of society have left off. I do know there are a number of people who have helped to uplift the legacy of John Dube, including the number of ministers of religion who are very supportive, like oh, oh, Reverend P.K. Lula, Reverend Shan, Reverend Skakane, and there are a whole lot of them. Uh, I won't forget who picks the Gasem. I know all the strategic discussions I can imagine they were having with John Dube. There are a number of people, as I said, in various sectors who really upheld John Dube's legacy. The relationship between UNISA and Ortlange High School must prosper. Similarly, the existing one between Ortlange High School and the provisional government must be nurtured. Same as the relationship between UNISA and the provisional government also must prosper. The signing of the MOU with the provisional government, and I'm made to understand there'll also be another MAU with Osange. That's the correct way forward, and we thank you for that foresight as UNISA. Mafugazala stood for the emancipation of a black child throughout his life. I submit he succeeded because the legacy of, of Mafugazala lives on. The walls of Osange are still standing. Learners are still educated at Osange. Thousands of South African South Africans still read Ilanga Lasse Natal. And millions are drinking from the well of his widow, wisdom in the books he authored. May his patriotic spirit forever inspire us. Madam Premier, Professor Vice, uh, Vice Principal representing the VC, I submit John Dube succeeded on his mission and was true to his calling to the end of his life. I thank you. Another round of applause. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, all those who have got ears have heard. Bonke la baba na malde ben kabanga uguti bezwile. What is very, very important this evening, most of us have been educated about the man that we always hear about. At times you ask yourself, when you look at the, today's leadership, you ask yourself, we always discuss in the corners. Unfortunately, I happen to be towards the very same age that is questionable in terms of leadership today. People are asking, why are we being led by the pensioners mostly? But if you go back and start looking at the first president of the ANC in together with 
his wife, Ugogo Unoktela. These were young people. Obviously, their peers were also young. And they did wonderful, wonderful work. Some of us were witnesses to that. The speaker who was here now is a product of a school built by a young man supported by a young woman. There is a saying in Zulu that says, Inkunzi Isema Tolin. Sigboni lege lo kongo baptube. Ube inkunzi emnane e yi tole. Wenza imsebenzi emkulu. Siabunga ge nina bagwa baktube. Siabunga ga kulu na wabagwa ngobo. Imsebenzi enu emise esi bonayo. Ne sacrifice nge esi zwangayo. Uma uzwa kutiwa ubaba wa SD. He had to abandon the promotion of Uba, um, surely at I. Giovu, sir. Um, sevens, um, Kulugangaga, Owa Wenziwa, is Lobo Setu, Noma is Lobo Sak, Goba, Ubaba, who Dr. J. L. Dube was a great friend of his own father, Ubaba Unobo, Ogu. Babaka Baba SD Mop. Siabong. Time is against us, but fortunately, I've got educated discadents. Two professors, Professor Meiwa, a daughter of Inanda as well, Professor Kumalo, a researcher and a writer about who Dr. J. L. Dube, I am inviting them to come to the podium. I've got, we have reserved two seats there for them. I know that they've got about 20 minutes, but they are going to reduce it to about five, five minutes, depending. And as they speak, those who want to raise questions are free to do that. But let's try by all means to ensure that maximum of three questions will make it. A lot of information has been shared today. It was really an information overloading. But be that as it may, I'm of the view it was well and very, very important to do, especially because the majority of us, I don't think they were aware of this wealth of information about Ubaba, Dr. J. L. Noma Umkulue to Dr. J. L. Dube. As soon as they are done, I'm not gonna come to the stage I will request the colleagues to raise their hands and discard and only three will be allowed to ask you questions and you will respond as you feel like responding. Immediately thereafter, when you are done responding to them, I will request Ubaba, Ulang Albalele Dube, who is the grandson of Humkulu, Dr. J. L. Dube, to come to the podium and give a word of thanks on behalf of the entire family for this very important occasion that we have witnessed tonight. Once that has been done, I will come to the podium and do the honor of inviting the KZN Regional Director Dr. Joyce Mieza to do the final word of thanks on behalf of the institution, UNISA and the region. Thank you. The discutant, you can.
take the podium. I don't know whether you want me to bring uh, the, or you are going to come to the podium. Thank you. Um, it has been a, a very interesting lecture. It's Kali Sangambela that we've got this evening from Judge Richard, my fellow zebra. And you actually will not have expected less. The passion from there you could really tell. I want to acknowledge um, the premier who was part of the family, she possibly would have left. And just to thank the family of Dube for having shared the Mafukuzela with us. Um, it means a lot, and for me in particular, having been a student at Oshlange about um, plus eight years or so after he founded the school, and literally a few meters away from the main house of his family. It holds good memories. Uh, in that, uh, acknowledging everybody and know that uh, from um, the program director, we have been given less time than we had planned for. My reflections are going to be more personal as well. I want to start off by the personal. In, as a feminist scholar, the personal is political. And for me, that's very important. And Usia and Dangumalo, the principal, this legacy still continues. In the very first day that the school starts, we will be taken to the grave as school children. And that's where you'll really have this sense of it's different here. If it's not continuing, I would actually encourage him to start that because it meant a lot for me and for all my siblings that I want to acknowledge as well. They're watching because all of us, my mom, who happened to have been a teacher at and um, also I know where she is. She's re she is herself having been a zebra is part of this. So with that said, you begin to be inducted as a school child with this kind of embracing of this is family. Uh, the girl's dormitory was just literally, as I say, about less than a hundred and a half meters away from where my dormitory was my entire time. And for that, in retrospect, it means a lot. Mr. Ngumalo, the other thing that I want to reflect on is that of um, 5 a.m. I remember, Magu Konama Zebra will have what siavuga, siavuga, siavuga. It will be very early in the morning where everybody must be on the, on the road and jogging, both boys and girls. The kind of uh, exercise that has taken me through to where I am. Even today, five o'clock is the time that I, I'm often at the gym most days, and I must thank Ima Fukuzela, um, as well as Ushanga for having instilled that in my life. And of course, looking at just one of the things now reflecting also personally from what the judge has shared with us, I cannot but marvel the fact that not only am I born, although Sensei Yonisa Manje in Enanda, that's where my uh, umbilical cord is, uh, but also Umafuzela had good stints with both areas where my mom and father were born. That is Umkumaz, where he actually, the judge did not make mention of this. He set up a school in Umkumaz where my mom was born, where her umbilical cord is and also a school where my father was born in Mwadi, where his political court is. And for me, this is really um, Judge Charlie. By the way, Unisa Press reports to me, so I'm going to be on your case to make a monograph of what you've done. So please prepare it, I wanna publish it. Mm -hmm. 
we, we look at this, um, Prof Kumalo, and with all your work, and for us as the, should I say, the descendants of Umafuguzela, it means a lot for us. It is spiritual more than religious, more than educational, more than what the judges reflected on, more than what since the start of the lecture we've heard of him as a passionate patriot, committed to serve, as the judge said, an agent of change, a solution bringer, uh, not just only religious despite him having been a a pastor, but spiritual in the sense that he will be, in nowadays language, an influencer, very much influencer to the point where um, I have my brother-in-law is actually in the room. He is, I think that's him. Uh, he's a zebra. Uh, he's actually traveled yesterday evening. He touched base uh, at um, Ushaga Airport around about 10 o'clock. Um, he's a businessman, he owns six garages um, because of Mafuguzela, but he left everything because he had to come and be here. That this kind of the spirit that you have this group uh, of zebras, uh, Amadube, that have this connection, forever connection that we have uh, to Mafuguzela. Because of him, as the judge has said, having been a philosopher, a vision leader, a liberator. And of course, for us as UNISA, being part of UNISA, we cannot but marvel at the correlation between whom Afuzela was, whom he brought for me personally, but also uh, his relationship in retrospect and resonating with UNISA. As a pioneer, UNISA is a pioneer. As uh, availing access to education, UNISA is the cheapest university in this land. It actually has given, as we've learned and we know, a number of people who are incarcerated as well as those that are in prison to these days. In the past, they will have been uh, people who are um, uh, liberating other people, political uh, prisoners. But we are a university that provides access, massive access, at a very cheap price and reach the width and breadth of the entire uh, world, being the only international university in this country. That's justice. That's Mafuguzela. That's UNISA. And this is what the judge has reflected on. And indeed, I'm very much spirited to want to publish that, that book, please, judge. I'm going to be on your case. Commitment, indeed, it, we have had. And one of the elements that uh, the judge possible, Prof. Mahali, you may probably have to follow this up. Mafuguzela received the doctoral degree, not just on the honorary. Could we just have a look at that? Could be that my, my uh, records are different, but we, we see him having that kind of liberating education beyond just what we've known him to be because of his black pride, because of his excellence, as the judge has said, and because of the values that he held and indeed the history lesson that we have learned out of what the judge has told us. Just a bit, I'm actually um, a student of uh, Umam Lambo. We used to call her Umam Lambo when she had not met Tunguga at the time. And I recall that uh, from time to time, we will have the police coming to arrest her while she was in class. And part of what she did, the Utlanga teachers, um, what I recall was the Kubekonale curriculum for um, our examinations, then they'll sit down around a round table and say, now let's talk the real history of this land. And that's where they'll start. And I think these are all the kind of things that Prof Kumala we need to chronicle and one person to follow in particular, Mamlambo, uh, So besides the fact that the judge has made reference, so we need to have this history as being taught in schools. The kind of history that uh, Ama Zebra were taught, uh, were taught about, and I in particular had to go through, is the one where she will put the, she was my history teacher, she'll put the, the textbook aside and, and say, 
Africa's history, South Africa's history, did not start as this book tells us. And this is, this is what, this is the kind of spirit. This is, of course, her herself being a zebra, having uh, studied Ruhlanga as well. It is all, as the judge says, the applicability, application of not just only the skills, the industrial uh, school that he founded, which in, in actual fact, Prof. Mukhale, he is a pioneer of what we have today as CHE, Council on Higher Education, for getting accreditation and, and just not saying, I'm going to create this curriculum, but find a body, find a credible institution to endorse the curriculum that had come about. We have a lot to write about. I'm just realizing that what the judge has shared with us is speaking volumes. Now, as a feminist, I'm not going to disappoint you. Who has Mafuguzela given birth to? Mafuguzela has given birth to um, not just only, or should I say him and his wife, Nogutela Mdima, Mafuguzela is a feminist in my books, in my analysis of him, a feminist scholar, a, a women's rights pioneer. During that time, you wouldn't have expected a man to defy the culture, the practice of the day. But he took along his wife and did not only do that, but listen, in 1894, when she said to him, you keep on lamenting and being unhappy about the current situation in terms of this education. Do something about it. Establish a school. Establish something that's going to respond to your gripe. Now, this is somebody in my schooling of feminism who is a feminist. Mafuguzela gave birth to Ellen Kuzwai, who's one of my mentors because from what she says, she talks of the view from below. She talks of, in her 1990 book, sit down and listen. Mafuguzela would not have done what he did had it not been Umundo Lalelayo who sits down and listens. Mafuguzela gave birth to another feminist, Uwini Mandela, one of the people I look up to in terms of as a quote here, she said, which very much reverberates Mafuguzela's values. Mandela, Winnie Mandela says, I'm not ashamed of anything I've ever done in the name of fairness and justice. Name of fairness and justice for my people. As I'm the product of the masses of my country and the product of my enemy. That kind of uh, being a product of both and embracing both and coming up with something out of it. Mafuguzela gave birth uh, to feminist that he himself was one. He also gave birth to uh, the last two program director uh, in Kwame Nkrumah's ideas. And Kwame Nkrumah makes reference to um, the importance of revolutionaries. He was a revolutionary as possible. Uh, one of our alumnus, uh, Umalema himself, although he likes calling himself a revolutionary, uh, we, we trained him, by the way, but that's a debate for another day at UNISA. Um, he, Nkrumah says, reverberating Mafuguzela's ideas, revolutions are brought about by men, by men who think as men of action and act as men of thought. This is what this lecture has brought to us uh, this evening to highlight, to enunciate, and actually bring this to the fore. And of course, I want to move to the last two people who I see reverberating uh, Mafuguzela's values, ideas, and ideologies, uh, that one being uh, Petrus the Mumba, when he says, a man may be a political animal, but there comes a time in a person's life when true service must be the ultimate goal. In the history of our country, in the history of our continent, this is the time. 
Mafuzele, as the judge has reminded us, was the person of the time, not of the time of his time, but of the time that actually is never ending. How convenient and relevant his ideas continue to be. And I want to end by what uh, his contemporary, in the name of Henry Ford, uh, that is the founder of the Ford Automation of Cars said, uh, they were only about five, four and, a year, four and a half years apart. And if anything, I want to believe that he is wanting to repeatedly go to the US was because of the ideas. Was he aware that they shared the same ideas, both as industrial uh, people, both as actually uh, people who are entrepreneurs, both as business magnates, because Mafuguzela indeed was not just an industrialist, but a business mandate. Henry Ford says, which is actually, uh, Prof Kumalo may um, concur with me in this, uh, these are actually Mafuguzela's words. If money is your hope for independence, you will never have it. The only real security that a man will have in this world is a reserve of knowledge, a reserve of experience, and a reserve of ability. And indeed, Mafuzela demonstrated all of this. Thank you, Judge Jali, for bringing this forth to us. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meiwa, um, Program Director, uh, to the Dube family, to Judge Charlie, and to the academics, friends, colleagues. Um, it's a privilege indeed to have been given this opportunity to reflect on Mafuguzela, on Jenga Zulu. It's, um, I'm one of those people, just like Sheriff Keita, every time I have to speak about Mafuguzela, I actually feel like I am actually possessed. Uh, there are some spirits involved because of the passion uh, that I have and having been exposed to his work. But I'm not gonna waste your time Lucky for you, I still have to drive to Peter Maritzburg. So I have to be quite conscious of the time uh, that I need to, 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 to be driving. But just f five points that I'm not going to expand much on, uh, that I just want to highlight on this as characteristics of um, what he did and contributed on. Firstly, uh, Mafuguzela saw religion not as an opium of the people, as Marx would have said, but as a vehicle for liberation and development, which it means that religion is not just a pie in the sky. I think a lot of this came from Judge Ali's uh, um, uh, input and lecture here. We could have picked that up quite easily. When you follow Mafuguzela's uh, understanding, of religion, it's clear. Religion is not to be used and understood as an escapist tool from the realities of life. But religion has to be understood as that institution that can help inspire people to work towards their liberation and freedom and development. That's important. Secondly, Mafuguzela for me was a father um, of Pan-Africanism. Um, he is the earliest person to be pushing from the African pers perspective for the liberation and the appreciation of Africans for being Africans, um, not being apologetic about that. Of course, it's understandable when one understands that he is amongst the first Africans to come into contact with people like Booker T. Washington, African Americans worship the ground that they think Booker T. Washington walked on. Mafuguzela did not imagine Booker T. He knew Booker T. Washington. He, he worked with him. He spoke to him. He, he, he drank from Booker T. Washington's uh, insights and knowledge. 
Um, and W.E. Du Bois, do we really know who we're talking about? One of the greatest Africanists uh, in the history of America. He knew him. He attended meetings that Du Bois called. Three, J.L. Dube and women. In fact, I want to push it further, uh, Professor Mayua. Uh, Mafuguzela is not just a, a, a feminist. Whilst he has feminist inclinations, but he's a product of women. He's a product of feminists. If we understand that he was left by, with a single parent, the mother, to raise him and make a leader out of him, she's the one who begs Wilcox and says, say, I have no money, I've got nothing, I've got eight children that I've been left with. I only have 30 pounds um, in my pocket. Please take this boy of mine and give him the best education that any black boy can get and one that only white boys get in South Africa. Take him with you to America. She's instilling. And if you go beyond her, the grandmother living at the royal house to go to the mission house with Dalita to become, to be converted and become a Christian and then raise her children from there and give, instill a different way of life where education and religion is important. And then when she meets him, he Noctela. Noctela is actually better than Dube because Noctela is already a qualified teacher. Dube has gone to America and has come back with nothing really to show for, for having gone because things didn't go well in those five years he was in the U.S., comes back without any qualification that he can boast about. He marries this young, beautiful woman who is already a qualified teacher and is teaching. And she begins to, as you say, she says, no, build a school. Let's do it together. They go to Inwati to build those two schools, Ichubane and Inwati, and the congregational church that is there. And all the, with Noctela, and it is not Teller again who motivates him. They go uh, to, to the U.S. to study. And there she sings in the halls to raise money to pay for their fees. He becomes the speaker. Again, you see Noctella, and it follows up. And when Noctella dies in 1917, Judge Charlie has reminded us, he marries Angelina Umakumalo. And then Umakumalo stays with him up to around um, when he, he died in 1946. So they just stayed about 26 years together. And she gave him those children, uh, the family that she built. But she then stays after Dube had died. Until 1985, when she died. About 40 years, all by herself as a widow, picking up, maintaining Dube's legacy so that Dube could never be forgotten. Such dedication, 40 years. Husband has died, left her young, but she's maintaining his legacy. With all the ups and downs of keeping Otlange and all, the, all those other things that uh, she did. So, in fact, Dube is surrounded by these women, but over and above that is the work that he then does to nurture women. Otlange is one of the first schools that is, is written about that actually broke the gender roles in schools. Dube intentionally said that girls and boys will do all the responsibilities, the chores, without having to say these are for girls, these are for boys. He intentionally spoke against gender roles in society in those years. Can you imagine? In those years. So of course he's conscientized by these women, which makes him a feminist in his own right, but of course, where does it come from? He has had the insight of what it means when you, you get confronted and are living with women at their best. Now, the, the second last point, J.L. Dube and traditional leadership. You'll remember that the ANC, when it was founded, uh, one of the upper houses was the traditional leaders. And that comes because Dube and Sam and all those are in appreciation of African traditional leadership, forms of leadership. So even if they are forming up a, a resistant movement, a political organization, they find a place 
for traditional leaders. Lastly, Dube, in fact, we can start by saying Seme is actually the mover and shaker in the formation of the ANC. But Seme is made by Dube. When Seme left South Africa to go to America, the person that he goes to, he goes to New York, Brooklyn, to go and work and live and study and find opportunities of study with Dube. And Dube literally supports Seme financially when he lands in New York. So in Dube, you find this principle that as we rise, we lift others. We lift some of our own with us. And as a result, Seme goes to Columbia University, which is there even today, becomes this amazing student and all that. Where did he get the start? It's with John Dube. And then he goes to, America, to, to Oxford in England to be accepted as a, as a barrister. It's because of the foundation laid by Dube. He comes back, he starts, he moves up to organize for the founding of the ANC. And in, in doing that, there is no doubt, even if Dube is not going to be in the meeting in Bloemfontein, it's clear, Seme and others are very clear who must lead the ANC at that time when they formed it. It's John Dube because of what they had seen it. Uh, Judge Jali says something that indeed Dube was, had some kind of a calling to serve his people. And he said that himself. Uh, he said, I believe that I am there to serve my people and all my people for that matter. Thank you very much. It's very, very inspiring and it's very, very educative. Um, any question? Just one or two or three, if there are any. But at times, it becomes very difficult to ask questions when everything has been made clear by your speakers. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, there is no question, good people. Thank you so much to all our speakers for being very, very good speakers because you are good teachers. It's always good to have teachers who can really, when they are sharing information, and you can see the type of audience of the students that you have, they were listening and everything was well understood. Uh, may I request uh, Ubaba Ujali to come and join the colleagues here so that uh, a token of appreciation can be shared with the three of you. <laughs>
then request to uh, Baba uh, Langalbalele to come and do a vote of thanks. Thank you, Program Director. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of those nights to be remembered. It actually needs to go to the annals of history that today one of the greatest institutions of higher learning, you know, in UNISA, we've seen participation from even some of the academia from University of uh, UKZN in the legs of uh, Professor Smanga Kumalo. Thank you very much for your participation. And once again, let me not allow me, uh, Mr. Chair or the program director, not to count you know, each and every participant that was on stage, but it suffice to give honor to the professors that have since given us some deeper historical you know, insights about our grandfather. The same goes to the former Otlange and the former judge, Siabongagakulu uh, Shongololo for those insights. For, for me, on behalf of the Dobe family, I actually just have to express my warmest gratitude to all of you who participated and made time to come and grace this occasion tonight. And again, as the Dobe family, we are eternally grateful you know, to be part of this you know, important public lecture of our grandfather. I'll try and just be as brief as possible because I can see some of you are actually nodding because of tiredness uh, for this long evening. But uh, just to get straight to the issues that as a family were, were indeed uh, indebted you know, to former Judge uh, uh, Tabani Jali and all other role players who made public lecture possible. The presentation today indicated quite clearly that all, all understanding the teaching, we all understanding the teachings of uh, our grandfather. We thank you for drawing our attention to many features that actually defined uh, our departed leader. Our message this evening is that we remain committed to the family work, as a family, the work uh, uh, that, that have since been embarked on and then also the partnership that uh, uh, Professor Mahali spoke about in terms of collaboration and reaching out to communities out there, particularly with the community of Inanda, since there are programs that are underway that are going to foster you know, relationships that are tied in education because our grandfather was very pro-education uh, to our local youths. And again, um, for one, to be uh, brief, I'll be brief in the sense that we just want to echo the sentiments to say uh, thanks to our premier who was with us uh, because of uh, not being well. You know, she could not uh, stay up until the end of the program. But we thank uh, participation and also the government who are saying the government can actually not do it all alone, but they do need the, our participation as the community and also looking at the grounds of Otlange because that's where everything, it's, it should actually serve as an embryo of a development. And uh, with those words, I'd like to thank one and all for your participation 
and say, let us work together. Let us uh, make sure that the community out there reap benefit out of these educational in, uh, initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mfuetu uh, Ulangal Balele Dube, on behalf of the Dube family, obviously on behalf also of the Ngobo family, because these families are together. Uh, before U Dr. Meza takes the podium, may I request I Mbongietu Uguti Izosi Valenselala whilst she is doing a poem as a Dr. Mieza will also immediately come and do a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gwimbong uh, Yetu. And Gwimnad, you would imbong Yetu, be we lady. Dr. Mesa. Dr. Chess Mesa now is going to give us a vote of thanks on behalf of UNISA and KZN region. Immediately after her, I will then vacate the stage and let Upu to Eriki. Thank you. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, I'm not going to uh, even take too much time because I know that time has been taken uh, 
uh, just give me just your three hours, then I'll be done. Um, today, in the presence of this distinguished gathering, I stand humble and deeply grateful. The honor bestowed upon me to address such a remarkable audience is truly overwhelming. Give me this opportunity to thank the program director, uh, Mr. Kolani Tubazane, for the sterling job that you've done, the esteemed presence of our honorable Ms. Nomusa Dubengube, the premier of KwaZulu-Natal, Professor Ketlan Dovu, Professor Matugu Mohale, Judge Jali, Professor Tenji Wemeyiwa, Professor Simangaliso Kumalo, um, and all, uh, all the esteemed individuals who are present here. Colleagues, um, I also want to thank the Dube family, the Ngobo family, the Othange High School, um, the Dube Institute, and the friends and the family that have gathered. Um, just give me an opportunity, colleagues, to also single out some of the executive members of uh, UNISA who are present. Um, Deputy Registrar, Mr. Kukong, um, De Executive Director, Human Resources, uh, Dr. Lamini, Executive Director, Legal Office, Dr. Peach, uh, Gauteng Regional Director, Ms. Masalesa, Eastern Cape Regional Director, um, Mr. Huang. I would also like to further extend my deepest appreciation to the members of the Wazulu Natal Provincial Government the representative from the Eteguini municipality, UNISA colleagues uh, from the KwaZulu Natal region, from other regions, and as well as the head office in Pretoria. Um, our stakeholders who are, were present or are still present, student leadership, and all the friends and guests of UNISA who have graced this occasion with their esteemed presence, your unwavering support and belief in the, in the importance of this lecture reaffirm the significance of the work we undertake. Um, I have to say that to those whose names I may have unintentionally omitted, I offer my sincere apologies. Please understand that it was never my intention to overlook anyone. Your presence here today adds immeasurable value to this gathering, and I'm honored to be surrounded by your wisdom and inspiration. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you.